this meeting to order at 6.32 p.m. We always begin with public input. If anybody has any comments that are not budget related at the hearing, you can make any comments you want about the budget. Seeing none, we move on to the student report. And we have Cassandra Fitz here today to give the student report. Okay, so for notable academic matters, the third quarter ended on Friday, April 5th, which was last week. Um, today is the first day of the third quarter. Um, sophomore MCAS happened two weeks ago. Um, for arts, winter percussion performed at the MICA competition this weekend and placed first in our division. Um, the concert band performed at MICA also and got a high silver, and chorus also performed at MICA and got a high silver. Um, for athletics, we're currently in the beginning of the spring sports season, so not a lot of new news yet, but uh, both the boys and the girls track teams won last week against Essex Tech. The NEMAS conference for student council is tomorrow. Um, next week is April break. Junior prom is this Thursday, and Eco Team is currently holding their second annual clothing swap where students can bring in clothing and trade it for clothes that are already in the bin. Um, and then for my work report, I was going to talk about Student Government Day, which was something I attended last Friday um, alongside one other student uh, in my grade. Uh, it was at the State House. Um, there's two kids from every school that go every year, um, and we got to read uh, copies of two bills, House Bill 1261, which is an act um, aiming to improve access to affordable higher education, and Senate Bill 311, which is an act relative to educator diversity. So we got to read over uh, copies of those two bills and then give mock testimony and vote on the bills. Um, and it was a really interesting experience and it was a lot of fun and I enjoyed it. Very good. Comments, questions? <coughs> The only comment that I'll make is just I was at the school a lot last week for all town band, all town chorus, everything going on. But it just is incredible to see what the performing arts are, and in particular how the band has improved in the last few years. And so, yeah, definitely nice to see the uh, growth of the program, the numbers, and well, the numbers are challenging because then you can't get a seat. But it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful to see. So, okay, hottest ticket in town. Yeah, thank you very much, Cassandra. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> okay, we move right along to new business and we'll begin with the budget. So just a couple quick comments before I open the budget hearing. Um, just for everybody in the audience, real quick, things are slightly different than usual. Usually we've had a budget workshop before the budget hearing, but the reality is we weren't gonna make any changes in, you know, if we, if we met at five o'clock and we figure like the, the revenue number, a lot of times at this point in time, the revenue number that we have, if there's not an override, is, is not quite set. We're still working that out. This year's a little bit different. We sort of know what the revenue number is. And so we figured it made more sense just to have the discussions about what the cuts are as part of the public meeting so everybody can hear them. And you don't have to crowd into the superintendent's you know, conference room for everybody to hear that. So with that being said, that means a couple members of the school committee haven't seen the public the cuts at all until this weekend so mr mcgowan and i are part of the finance planning team so we've been part of those discussions because we've been meeting but everybody else has it so this will be the first opportunity they have to make comments and questions as well so just in terms of how this is going to go i think dr daly and mr uh, connelly are going to lead us through the presentation we have a lot of the administrative team the principals and administrative staff here i think i've been told they have some comments as well about the about where we're at then we'll sort of have some questions from the school committee and open it up to any public comments or questions or concerns you want to raise. So with that being said, I will open the uh, school budget hearing for FY25 and turn it over to Dr. Daly. Thank you so much. All right. <clears throat> Dear North Reading Public Schools community, thank you for coming together this evening as we do every year to develop a budget that will support the students of our public schools. I'd like to thank Mr. Michael Connolly, Assistant Superintendent of Finance and Operations for the incredible work that he does throughout the year on this process, which begins early in the fall of the upcoming fiscal year. Along with the principals and directors, our administrative council, he works to develop a budget that is responsible, forward-thinking, and aligned with the district goals and objectives 
as outlined in our strategic plan, NRPS 2025. The most important factor in the success of our students is a high quality teacher. But gone are the days of a one size fits all approach for students where a classroom teacher is able to work in isolation with their class. When we look at the highest achieving districts, there are so many other variables that come into play, including coaches who help teachers grow professionally and share the latest trends and topics that will have benefits for students in a rapidly changing world. We continuously hear from parents that they want students to succeed in literacy, mathematics, and science. And to do that, we need to have support in place to identify where students have gaps in their learning and provide those interventions that are needed to build a solid foundation so each child can move forward and reach higher. This evening, you will hear statements from our building principals and district administrators who will provide additional details on both the impact that budget cuts would have on students and programs, as well as some of the benefits of advancing our strategic plan, NRPS 2025, such as having at least one full-time adjustment counselor per building, eliminating the barrier of tuition-based kindergarten program, and having interventionists to enact our multi-tiered system of supports for students. Among the topics you'll hear about this evening are the advantages for lower class sizes, having many opportunities for athletics, performing arts, and extracurricular activities, developing highly specialized programs to meet the unique needs of individual students, providing social, emotional, and mental health supports in a proactive manner, and the need for us to integrate technology and provide support for our device infrastructure. Tonight, as we discuss the budget drivers, it is important to note that although salaries certainly account for nearly 83% of the budget, the cost of living adjustments for our employees are aligned with the market and well-deserved for the tremendous work they do every day. We have heard from many in the community who express their support for our paraprofessionals and educators. Now, I'd like to thank Mr. McGowan, who has been in negotiations with the first, with the, first with the North Reading Paraprofessionals and most recently with the North Reading Education Association, NREA, meaning for many long afternoons continuously since last April. He, along with Mr. Friedman, who has also been part of the NREA negotiations since the fall, is hopeful that we will soon have an agreement with our educators for a fair contract that was bargained in good faith. At this time, I would like to also acknowledge and thank the finance planning team which is made up of two members from the Select Board, the School Committee, and the Finance Committee, as well as representatives from the Capital Improvement Planning Committee, CIPC, the Town Manager, Town Finance Director, the Assistant Superintendent for Finance and Operations, and the Superintendent. Several of those folks are with us this evening. This group meets regularly throughout the year to forecast the financial needs of the schools in the town and develop a plan to support our budgets. Every year, we find a way to balance the budget and to continue to move forward, often at the expense of advancing our educational goals and enhancing the best practices to impact student learning as outlined in our strategic plan. As we have been discussing for several years, we anticipated that the budget for FY25 would be challenging, with the loss of the elementary and secondary school relief ESSER funds, rising costs across the board, and the reality that there are not many opportunities for new growth and revenue in the town. From what I gather in speaking with other school leaders, many communities are facing similar financial conditions. The Student Opportunity Act, which was enacted after years of studying the financial funding formula for the, appropriate, for the appropriation of Chapter 70 funds, does not bring any additional dollars to North Reading as we continue to be funded at the minimum $30 per pupil increase for educational state aid. Also of note, North Reading is very close to a 2% threshold for the poverty rate, making one of the lowest poverty districts in the state and we stand to lose federal funding for our Title I programs in the coming years, funding that provides academic support for students in need. The public hearing is an important part of the budget development process, and I'm thankful for the meaningful discussion that will take place this evening as we share the implications of potential cuts, not only for the upcoming year, but also for the immediate years ahead, when we will certainly be faced with making all of these very difficult decisions in order to balance the budget with limited resources. As always, thank you for your continued support of the North Reading Public Schools, Every year, everyone works together to provide the best education for our students within the available budget. And so what we've prepared, Michael has a presentation. We've also put together a few slides to go over a few basic uh, terms. I think there's some positions and some um, roles in the district that may not be clear to everyone. And so we wanted to take a few moments to go over that so that it's very clear when we talk about the cuts exactly what those positions are. So Michael, do you want to? Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you. Great. So my hope is to provide some um, 
kind of background slides. There's already been a couple of different opportunities to kind of engage in the budget through a preliminary budget presentation that occurred a few weeks ago and through a budget webinar. So I'm not going to be as detailed in my opening comments tonight. But my hope is for folks that haven't heard um, some of the previous presentations just to provide some context of where we are at with the fiscal year 2025 school budget, some of the challenges that we're continuing to debate and discuss and that we're struggling with in terms of the different budget proposals and what they include and what those impacts could be. Um, and then as well as certainly I'm going to start with the budget drivers that um, really the typical budget drivers that are always driving a school department budget um, and then some of the unique challenges that we're faced um, I think both from a school and a town that are certainly causing some some larger budget gaps and, and revenue challenges than we've faced previously. Um, so main budget driver, there's no, this will be the case not only in North Reading but certainly across the Commonwealth or in any kind of school department budget because we're certainly made up a lot of personnel um, and personnel and salary costs make up about 83% of a school department budget, and that's a very common stat um, in, in all school municipal budgets, that that's going to be a, a, a major budget driver in all cases. So we certainly have had to meet our contractual salary obligations and certainly fund um, those required cost of living adjustments um, to, for our employees and employee unions. Um, we've, as Dr. Daly mentioned, we have been um, hard at work with the NREA and, and Teachers Association to negotiate a, a fair and a contract um, into the future. So we've certainly included what we feel is a necessary um, adjustment in the salary pool to, to meet those, um, that, that increase. Um, and we continue to, to move through that process. But certainly a, a big, big driver is going to be the ability to meet our contractual salary obligations. Um, this year, we always have operational fixed cost increases um, that are fixed that we can't avoid, and um, that's always going to be the case, and that's always going to drive the school budget. When I talk about our operational fixed cost, what I mean is we certainly had nothing kind of gets cheaper than the year before, and we've seen, we've seen higher increases that have been typical through inflation, through supply so shortages over the last few years that are driving areas of building maintenance up, utility costs up, um, busing costs up, both from regular transportation and special um, ed transportation. Um, all those costs are going up. We've had to go out to bid this year for next year for our regular transportation contract, or we've had to kind of uh, discuss whether or not to go out to bid because the, the option year to renew next year is just driving those costs up. Sort of the, there's been a shortage of fuel, shortage of bus drivers, so all these costs are driving what would be maybe more moderate increases much higher next year as we, as we look at our operational fix, fixed costs. Um, the other driver is our, what is known as NRPS 2025, and that is our educational strategic plan. And we, for many years here in North Reading, have worked with the school committee and our administrative team and all of our stakeholders to really make our strategic plan really drive our enhancements and our initiatives to drive the district forward. And we, it's a kind of a very fluid document that um, Dr. Daly updates the school committee on and the community on regularly throughout each uh, school year. And we have many initiatives um, that we've had to defer over the last number of years and we have certainly high priorities in terms of positions that we want to drive the district forward. So we'll certainly get into some of those positions um, later on in the presentation, but that's certainly a driver of our budget next year. And one of the things that it's also an additional challenge that we're facing um, that's also driving the school, school budget and the, the higher increase than, no, than normal or, or typical for next school year is the loss of what is known as ESSER funding. And that was the COVID-19 relief funding that we've had um, really since fiscal year 2021. And that's been kind of dwindling each year. And we've kind of planned for this and we knew that this day was coming. We've tried to be strategic on not using all those funds in one fiscal year and tried to minimize the impact of that funding cliff um, scenario. But the reality is, is we have been relying on, on funding each year. That's funding uh, for very key uh, positions that are very much part of our program that we feel is important to continue. And we've had to make adjustments and shifts into the operating budget to continue um, 
with the loss of that funding. So that's certainly driving the budget. And then the other aspect is our special education costs. Um, certainly one of the mo more um, difficult to predict uh, uh, line items in the budget. And that is certainly a driver of next year's budget as it uh, always is. And that both includes our in-district special education costs and our out-of-district special education costs. Um, these costs have also been increasing. We've been seeing the cost to transport students to in-district programs as well as, as well as out-of-district to private and collaborative placements. Um, nothing's getting cheaper. They're dealing with some of the same shortages and, and revenue challenges that all districts are facing. So we've seen high rate increases from our private day placements in schools that students are educated at as well as the cost to transport them. Um, so we've had to make several adjustments over the last couple of years, and that is certainly the case next year. Higher kind of rate increases than we've seen typically. Um, we're also anticipating an increase in the number of students being educated outside the district. Um, we currently uh, have budgeted, in the current fiscal year, there's 37 students in our district placements, and we're anticipating that that number is going to increase to, um, by three students to 40 students. So we've had to make these adjustments um, from year to year. And I'll just note, as Dr. Daly noted earlier in his opening comments, that we always, part of our process and annual review, and um, Cynthia Kona is here, and uh, she does a great job with her staff, is that we're always evaluating our special education programs. And where appropriate, we're reallocating our current resources um, in district to provide the additional uh, student support service um, to, to educate students um, you know, in district. Um, but currently, 18.4% of our student population, including students being educated outside of the district, receive special education services. And that is just below the state average of 20.2%. Um, and currently, 8.5% of those students receiving special education services are educated outside of the district. And many districts in the area um, have seen this number increase um, above, above 10%. And this has been a very common um, situation across the Massachusetts and coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so those are certainly uh, the main drivers of the budget that have certainly caused some of these high increases. So now if we get into what our preliminary budget proposal has been to the school committee, and these are the numbers that we've presented um, previously, if you compare our fiscal 2025 sort of recommended or preliminary budget um, to, that we've recommended to the school committee, and you can see how these major expense categories compare to the current fiscal year 2024. So some of the drivers I just spoke of, you can certainly see by looking at the percent increases and the changes from prior fiscal year, I think you can see them kind of reflected here at play. As sal salaries going up 7.5%, again, that's the largest driver. In part, that's the need to meet our contractual salary obligations. It's also the need to add some staffing to um, address an increase of enrollment at the elementary level, and particularly in our primary grades, the kindergarten and first grade and second grade. So we want to be able to maintain what we feel are our class size guidelines mm -hmm. in the, at that level. And it's well, as also reflected there is the need to shift some of those SR positions into the operating budget. So that loss of rev revenue that we've had the last few years, um, as well as a, a need to look at our strategic plan and be able to try to move the district forward and provide some enhancements in the areas of social emotional um, health, the areas of um, academic intervention uh, support, and those are high priorities the district has going forward. Um, so overall, we, we recommended a budget that was a little more than $40.6 million or $3.3 .3 million higher in fiscal 24. And that was a preliminary budget proposal that was 9% higher than the prior fiscal year. So if you look at this pie chart, um, we've been talking about what makes up the major expense categories. And um, we've mentioned that salaries and compensation make up about 83%. So you can see here at 82.9% is what is the largest piece of the pie of our school budget. Um, the remaining 17% of the costs are made up of expenses of which I feel the majority of those expenses are fixed. So I think it's very easy to look at a um, $40 million plus budget proposal or recommendation and think that there's a lot of flexibility within that budget. And I, I think the reality is in a school 
school budget because so much of that is fixed with our contractual salary obligations as well as our fixed operational costs for utilities expenses, for our out of district tuitions, for our contracted services. Those make up an additional 14.1%. So when you look at those fixed costs and our obligations, it really only leaves about 3% remaining of kind of discretionary spending, which is really about $1.2 million. And that, those are the supplies and the materials and technology and everything that we embed into the classroom um, to make the educational experience what it is for the students. So what I'm attempting to do here is kind of sh break down the budget um, and look at the major categories that are driving the budget, um, the increases from fiscal year 2024. Um, and I'm trying to act also illustrate the differences between what we consider a level services budget, which is to maintain the same level of services that we're all experiencing today in North Reading in, in current fiscal year 2024, this current school year. Um, and what we feel we need to continue to maintain those services next year. And then what, what we, we would consider above and beyond level services, which we've always referred to here as a modified level services budget. So the community and folks can understand the differences between the two, the two requests. So if you look at some of these breakdown, I, we've mentioned the contractual salary obligations, also including a salary pool for our um, negotiations with the NREA uh, is about um, 4.6 percent of that 9 percent increase. We have positions driven by the need to increase staffing to handle increases in enrollment at the elementary level as adding about another 0.5 percent. The loss of that SR funding and the need to try to shift that um, the loss of that funding into the operating operating budget is about a little bit more than another 0.5 percent increase of that 9 percent request. Um, the need to make it adjustments to our fixed cost contractual increases like busing utilities and materials that I spoke of earlier is also driving those an increase our special education costs in terms of transportation and our district tuitions is driving um, that increase we also have additional revenue known as circuit breaker uh, reimbursement that helps offset our special education out of district tuition costs, and those are always based on prior year expenses. So that number is actually increasing. So that's why that there's a reduction to the increase noted there. So we would consider all of these increases netting to a 7.1% increase, really level services increase increases to maintain the same level of services. Um, any, everything below that line is above and beyond, and, and that includes our newly requested positions, which We've spoke of, and we can get, get into it later in the presentation, which was 5.6 FTE positions, um, increases to our extraordinary maintenance budget to help address unforeseen costs that we've seen, and we've, we want to properly maintain our five, five schools. And then we've had a longstanding uh, initiative and goals in our strategic plan to move to free full-day kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And to do that would be the need to move $200,000 of sort of loss of kindergarten to it, of revenue, of tuition revenue into the operating budget. And the actual impact of that is actually greater than $200,000, but we have built up a kind of a reserve based on conservative spending over the last few years, and we uh, are trying to kind of moderate the impact of that loss of revenue over the next, you know, two or three years. So all in all, an additional 1.9% based on our preliminary request was adding to the budget and that's how we got to the nine percent so a lot on that slide but i hope folks kind of see the breakdown um, we were prepared this evening um, understanding and recognizing that the revenue challenges and the situation the community is in with the the current budget gaps to make recommendations the administration was to the school committee to consider reducing some of those new requests and new positions that were guided by our strategic plan. So these are positions we do not have currently um, to, the, to the school committee for consideration. Um, so we had requested an, an increase of 5.6 FTE positions. And if this was adopted, this proposal would reduce the, that increase by an additional four positions or a little more than $346,000. Um, which would reduce our recommended budget to the school committee, that is, from 9% down to 8.1%, and that's a, 
That's $346,000 and $78,000 less than our original proposal. Um, and what we're trying to just find a balance between what the high priorities are in the district and um, recognizing the, the difficult you know, revenue challenges and what's sustainable into the future. Um, we also would very much, as we always do, look at ways where we could look at some additional resources and try to reallocate funds to um, potentially make some of these new initiatives and new positions kind of a cost-neutral situation, and that's something we're always looking at. Um, we, we have done that and we'll consider, continue to do that um, as we move th forward through this process. So the changes there, just, the, just highlighted one, is if, we, if those were to be adopted, the new 5.6 FTE positions would be reduced to, from the original $476,000 number down to 130811 And then our new revised request would be a recommended budget that is 8.1% higher, or a little more than $3 million higher than the previous fiscal year. And that would be the only change. We would still want to move forward with recommending free universal full day kindergarten to the community, as well as the other level services adjustments. Um, and we'll talk a little bit in a moment about what each budget includes. So before I turn it over uh, back to Dr. Daly um, to talk about some of the other um, positions and so forth, I think what's on the table kind of in summary, everything I just went over and that we've been talking about for the last few weeks is I think that, that we're really discussing three main budget proposals um, that we've been, uh, that are kind of on the table currently. And the first column represents a balanced budget, and that would be a budget that currently meets the available revenues through the revenue plan of the um, finance planning team and the guideline budget that we've received to date. And that budget was, was 3.9% higher than the current fiscal year 2024 budget. So a budget of $38,000. $772,128. So we are, um, our level services budget was about $1.2 million higher than that. So for us to um, move to that um, spending level, we believe, and we'll get a moment in this presentation what that includes, that that would require a reduction of about 15 positions, a little bit more than that in, in North Reading to achieve that budget. The next budget I think that we've discussing is that level services budget. This is a budget to maintain our current level of services, shift some of the spending that from the loss of um, COVID-19 grants into the operating budget, add some staffing to address the increase of enrollment at the elementary level, and that was about 2.4 FTE positions um, to maintain the same class sizes that we've had here for a number of years in North Reading. Um, as well as to adjust for the contractual salary obligations and the fixed costs, et cetera, was a budget that was 7.1% higher. Um, and that would add 2.4 FTE positions um, that are driven by enrollment increases. So our revised budget proposal or recommendation to the school committees, what we refer to as a modified level services budget, which essentially achieves level services, and then really conservatively tries to look at our strategic plan and try to achieve some high priority positions within that strategic plan. And the revised recommendation with the reduction of those four positions, but still adding a 0.6 school adjustment counselor, so all three elementary schools can, uh, all, all schools <coughs> across the district can have an, a designated school adjustment counselor, and you'll hear from the principals, as well as Dr. Daly, the importance of that position, um, would be achieved as well as one additional academic interventionist to help to uh, provide those academic support systems. Um, probably focus at the elementary level, but we would try to leverage that position across the district as much as possible. And that would be a budget um, that is 8.1% higher in the current fiscal year 2024 budget. And that would only add four positions, um, which would be the 2.4 enrollment driven positions as well as that 1.6 increase from our strategic plan. So I think those are the budgets that we're, we're currently um, debating and discussing that's kind of on the table. And we're gonna get into some of the, some impact statements in a moment about 
what could result if we don't achieve level services or our recommended budget proposal. Um, so at this time, I'm going to hand it back to Dr. Daly. The committee have any clarifying questions for Michael on the numbers at this moment? Or? No, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Only clarification that I might just point out is the balanced budget, just to point out the revenue being used for that is still probably more than a lot, a lot of people on the finance planning team feel comfortable with because even that number is factoring in 1.6 million from debt exclusion funds. It's factoring in 750,000 for interest, which you know interest rates are high right now, but that doesn't sustain forever. And so these are things that we can do occasionally, we can do right now, but if we continue to do that, it's going to deteriorate over time. And so even the balanced budget number is a challenging number for the revenue side to support each year over year. So. Just want to add that while we're looking at that. Thank you. So at the request of some conversations I had with members of the committee and also some information I've gathered from the community, we provide a, a, a brief overview of um, some of the positions and terms that we're discussing, both that may be some of the reductions or also some of the ads. We will do this uh, briefly, but also I think succinctly in order to communicate what sometimes can be educational jargon, something like an academic coach that we know exactly what that is, I wanna make sure that it's clear as we then discuss the impact. So we refer often to the multi-tiered system of supports or MTSS. We're going to speak throughout this presentation about tier one, tier two, and tier three. So our 30,000 foot understanding is this, tier one is universal support. This is what's happening in a, a classroom on a daily basis for all students. Tier two is going to be more targeted support, and tier three is our intensive support. And by the way, I've given uh, clearance for everyone to, to shout out if I say something that's not quite <laughs> so Please jump in. Classroom teachers, I think that's pretty clear to what everyone, um, and what this means, but we wanna share uh, some information here about what our target sizes are that we talk about. In the primary grades, grades one and two, a target size of less than 20 students, 20 or less. Um, in, in grades ki in kindergarten, um, and also in three to five, we look at a number of around 22, and the kindergarten has the asterisk there because with the paraprofessional, um, it's, it's that two to one ratio that we are able to get into some um, higher numbers there. Otherwise, it would, be, it would be that 20 number or lower as well. Um, the classroom teachers have that impact on the educator's ability to meet with individual students in small groups, obviously, if they have uh, too large of a class size. And it's really important that they're doing the foundation. Um, this is where all of this foundations of learning of academic and social skills in tier one. Special education teachers, as we know, provide support for students with disabilities. They also provide accommodations and modify content as appropriate in alignment with students' individualized education programs, or IEPs. They co-teach, they teach small groups, and they teach substantially separate programs. And that could be in different scenarios. It could be tier one, two, and three. They also conduct academic testing and facilitate IEP meetings, and they process those meetings as well. Dr. Daly, yes. can I just add, um, for everyone, um, the liaison serves as the first point of contact for parents of students So interventionists and tutors. So when we talk about our tiered system of support, these are folks who analyze data to identify individual student needs. They support students with direct instruction during math or literacy intervention blocks for tier two and three support. They do what's called progress monitoring, so checking in on our students and seeing how they're progressing towards their goals. They're an integral component of this multi-tiered um, system of supports for academics. An academic coach is a content expert and instructional leader in specialized areas such as literacy or mathematics, provides scheduled support for all classroom teachers in, in all classrooms and collaboration meetings. They model lessons, co-teach, plan, they provide instruction, they, can, uh, they provide data analysis, goal setting, and progress monitoring. They're up to date on current research and best practices for professional development, and they directly support student learning through small group and individualized instruction in tier three. So this is a breakdown of our counselors. We have three different types of counselors in the district, guidance counselors that I think many of us are familiar with. 
school psychologists, and school adjustment counselors. And I know these roles have evolved very different from when I was in uh, school myself. They also differ slightly in our district how these uh, function at the different grade levels. So this slide speaks to elementary counselors. So we have school adjustment counselors who plan and facilitate classroom SEL lessons for tier one and tier two. They model best practices for SEL during instruction. They conduct one-on-one -on -one counseling service for non-special education students. They assist with crisis intervention, facilitate small group counseling for all students, and conduct universal screenings. The school psychologists administer special education assessments and write reports. They provide services for students with social emotional goals in their IEP, such as one-on-one -on -one or small group. They attend special education meetings, coordinate and oversee students' 504 plans, conduct safety assessments for those potentially at risk of harming themselves or others. At the middle school level, we have school adjustment counselors who serve as clinical coordinators for the middle school bridge program, meet with any students experiencing social emotional difficulties, conduct universal screenings, assist with crisis intervention, provide small group counseling, and provide staff training such as restorative practices. At the middle school, you'll see some overlap here between a psychologist and what we would think of as a typical guidance counselor role. As they administer special education assessments and write reports, provide counseling services for students with social emotional goals in their IEP, one-on-one -on -one in small group, attend special education meetings, meet with any student experiencing social emotional difficulties, coordinate and oversee students' 504 plans, conduct safety assessments for those potentially at risk of harming self or others, meet with students experiencing academic difficulties, oversee the course selection and course change processes, assist students with applying to vocational technical high schools, private schools. At high school, just to pull out what the guidance counselors focus on, meeting with students experiencing academic difficulties, meet with students experiencing social emotional difficulties, assist students with all facets of post-secondary planning process, oversee the course selection and course change processes, attend special education meetings, coordinate and oversee students' 504 plans, and parent and family engagement, which certainly uh, applies to all of us. <coughs> High school counselors also serve as clinical coordinators for the bridge program, counseling support for students, meet with students with social emotional difficulties, conduct safety assessments, and conduct universal screenings. <coughs> the psychologists focus on administering special education assessments and writing reports, provide counseling services for students with social emotional goals, attend special education meetings, assist with conducting safety assessments for those potentially at risk of harming self or others as needed. So this was meant to just clarify and draw out some of the differences between these positions. The newest positions in our district are the school adjustment counselors. Full day kindergarten. I want to speak for just a moment here. I know we've heard this a lot um, at our committee meetings when we talk about the Student Opportunity Act. But we have had a goal as a part of our strategic plan and also as a part of our Student Opportunity Act plan where we have to file that plan with the state and choose from a, a drop-down menu of items. One of those items is to have free universal pre-K. Since we are one of only 15 districts that have a kindergarten tuition, we are focusing first on eliminating our uh, <coughs> kindergarten tuition. Since we have been reducing our kindergarten tuition, which is now currently 2,500, you can see how it's um, lowered over the several years due to the work that Michael Connolly spoke to about um, offsetting this in our budget and reducing it, we've seen a great increase in the number of students who are enrolling in full day kindergarten, which that data alone tells us that we had a barrier in place for students to receive full universal um, full day K. And so we're continuing to work towards that mission. And this is a goal, like I said, of both our strategic plan and the plan that we submit to the state. The COVID and ESSER funding, as uh, Michael spoke to, I want to just address a few things with this. Um, the main focus of this funding we used were things that are evident and related, obviously, to the pandemic, but there were certainly needs that existed well before the pandemic with our nursing and technology supports and our school adjustment supports for mental health. And there's certainly things that continue to this day. This did not all stop as soon as uh, masks came off and we came back to school um, full time. The needs for our floater nurse to 
fill in at all schools to provide additional coverage and support when we have our um, nurses out or when there's screenings happening is essential. We'll hear from our, our digital learning team about the importance of technology technicians and a lot about our school adjustment counselors from all schools. The process for advertising uh, this was and for creating these positions was transparent. We solicited feedback from all stakeholders in the community. We posted this on our website and submitted a plan. It was discussed for several years. So this, not only the, the plan, but the, the fact that this would be um, a financial obstacle to overcome is something we've discussed during our budget process for several years going back. The last one I want to speak to, which I know we'll hear from Dr. O'Connell on as well, the late bus, which provides transportation to students who do not otherwise have a ride home and allows for more students to participate in extra help clubs and extracurricular activities. So I wanted to just uh, ask our administrators just to share for a moment some of the impact, both of losing some of these positions and also what we would gain by adding some of these positions and carriers to move our district forward. Did we figure who was going to go first with the elementary? Okay, thank you. <coughs> this Molly was trying to follow this. Uh, good evening, I'm Phil McCann with the school principal. NRPS 2025 is a proactive strategy for continuously improving the North Reading Public Schools. As we work through the budgetary challenges, the elementary principals and I want to share our impact statements with an understanding that we have worked diligently to create a proactive response system to meeting student needs and that the specific budget cuts to the elementary schools impact our ability to continue to do this to efficient levels. Low class size, so important. Our classrooms are comprised of young learners with a wide variety of experience, abilities, and needs. Classrooms with lower enrollments are environments that are physically and emotionally safer. They foster a more personalized approach to teaching and learning and the ability to nurture each child's unique needs and abilities. If we hope to continue on the same trajectory trajectory of student success as we have seen in recent years, we must consider the unfavorable impact that larger class sizes will have on our schools now and in the future. Low class sizes in elementary school are a vital component to meeting the needs of all our students. Increased class sizes may result in less individualized attention for students, disruptions to the classroom setting and the learning process, lower student engagement due to less personalized attention and potential disruptions, decreased academic performance, increased workloads for teachers. They'll have they could have additional responsibilities, workloads, and that could lead to potential burnout. And another problem that's plaguing all of us is increased absenteeism could be a result of larger class sizes. And we're also seeing an increase in school anxiety, and we would anticipate that larger class sizes where children are getting less individualized attention could lead to more school anxiety. So I'd like to speak to the school adjustment counselors. School adjustment counselors currently serve as our tier one instructional points of contact meaning that they provide instruction in social-emotional learning to all of the students in our elementary classrooms. They complete this one time per week for 30 minutes. Furthermore, these individuals provide Tier 2 instruction to some of our students who are experiencing difficulties. Without their assistance, we will be reacting to behaviors as opposed to being effective facilitators of learning experiences during challenging times for our students. So not having school adjustment counselors will limit our support for students' emotional and behavioral needs. Without the school adjustment counselors, students may struggle to manage their emotions and behaviors effectively, increased behavioral issues. The absence of the school adjustment counselor might result in an increase in behavioral issues among students due to lack of appropriate interventions and real-time supports. Limited resources for students in crisis in situations where students are facing personal or family crises, 
these absences, the absence of the school adjustment counselor could lead to them having inadequate support. Impact on school climate and culture. A school adjustment council often plays a role in promoting an effective and positive school climate and culture. The absence could potentially impact the overall atmosphere of the school. Increased pressure on teachers. Teachers may have to take on additional roles and responsibilities in addressing students' emotional needs in addition to their teaching responsibilities, leading to increased stress and reduced effectiveness in the classroom. In, in having these conversations about potential um, cuts, I, I always go back to the kind of the bigger team concept and each one of these positions or individuals plays an integral role in the school team, in the district team. Uh, our academic interventionists are an integral part of our MTSS approach. Um, their support is tied directly to our school improvement plan goals. Currently, our academic interventionists support student learning and development in both language, English language arts and mathematics during the school day. The intervention is specializes in providing targeted support to students facing academic challenges, working closely with individuals and small groups to address specific learning needs and close gaps in understanding. They use data to implement interventions to, to ensure student success. They collaborate and work closely with teachers to identify students who are in need of support. They develop plans to support those students and they help implement these plans. The collaboration with the classroom teachers for instructional planning and delivery is paramount. They're essential to our tiered data-driven model as they collect relevant data to drive instruction and maintain accurate student records to monitor progress. They're an integral key, a part of the team to provide the student success and learning that we expect. Our kindergarten paraprofessionals, um, Dr. Daly spoke about the target class size for our, our kindergarten, our youngest learners. If there is a reduction in any of that support at those primary grades, we would have reduced individual support for our youngest students. They play a crucial role in providing individualized support to young students, especially those who may need extra help with learning or some behavioral issues. Classroom management would be disrupted. I don't know if you've ever been in a class of, of 22 kindergartners, but it's very difficult for one, one adult, one classroom teacher to manage all of those young learners, which then could become a distraction for other learners, stressful for the classroom teacher, therefore impacting learning. And I would also have to talk about the lack of preparedness for the next grade level. Our, our kindergarten students in the model that we have now are so very well prepared to go on to grade one and be successful. Um, you, know, you talk about teens, you talk about foundations. At that kindergarten level, we're building the foundation. Our classroom teachers, our paraprofessionals are building that foundation for the success that we see in the rest of the grades. So as we wrap up, just to go over, the combined impact to all of these proposals um, would be an overall decline in school performance, a combination of large class sizes, disrupted learning, limited social emotional support, and reduced individualized support for students can lead to a decline in overall school, per school performance and student outcomes. The strain on school resources. The school administration may face challenges in managing the increased workload and demands with limited resources, potentially affecting the quality of education and support services provided to students. There is a potential negative perception from parents and the community. The loss of key staff members can result in a negative perception from parents, the community, and other stakeholders which can further impact the school's reputation and credibility. <coughs> increased stress and burnout amongst staff. The existing staff may experience increased stress, burnout, and job dissatisfaction due to the additional responsibilities and challenges. And lastly, a potential increase in attendance and behavioral issues 
without adequate support and resources, there may be an increase in student, uh, increase in um, student ab absences and behavioral issues affecting both short-term and long-term student outcomes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity <clears throat> to speak about the potential budget impacts at the middle school. During this season, it's been um, very challenging to consider uh, what we've been trying to build over the last many years and needing to really make some hard decisions. One area of focus for the middle school has been special education, really focusing on, um, with the help of Ms. Conant, working to develop our programs, working to uh, really focus on that achievement gap when you look at our data our special education students really are a target for us. And so over the past few years, we've been really bolstering our special education programming at the middle school, really with that effort to close the achievement gap for, for these <coughs> this particular subgroup of students. We've been able to develop specialized programs to educate our students in district, which as we know is very important. This has resulted in enhanced programming for our special education students due to the current challenges of this budget season, we found ourselves in a position that requ requires us to re-examine all of our programs, but specifically special education programming at the middle school and how we service students, re reallocating funds and resources, which could potentially lead to less individualized attention. Certainly all students, particularly at this level, require, uh, I think, require individual education uh, programs to help them reach their potential. And, you know, the, pot, the negative potential impacts of reducing uh, the, 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 our ability to provide these funds is concerning. Additionally, hearing my colleagues speak about staff stress, our staff are very dedicated, very, very uh, loyal to the the ability to provide the best programming possible for our students. So when class sizes increase, when they are asked to do more with less, it definitely can have impacts on their overall well-being. The adjustment counselor that we've had at the middle school for the last two years has made a significant difference at, um, at all levels. I think with students, with staff, with our community, We've been very fortunate to, uh, to use the, this position to particularly help our school psychologists. We have three school psychologists, and if you recall the slide that Dr. Daly shared with their just very long list of responsibilities, the adjustment counselor has been able to help the school psychologists work together to meet the needs of our students. We have something called the guidance check-in form. We've had it for probably four or five years now where students self-refer themselves to guidance. It's, it's pretty neat. We have all the data for the reasons why, what they need, and it's like triage. So we have four people now, historically we've had three, needing to every day go through the guidance check-in data and make sure that the students are seen and their, and their um, concerns are met. And the, the adjustment council has really helped with that. Also, as with at the elementary schools, they are designing the tier one SEL lessons. So once a month, the middle school pauses and the entire school runs an SEL lesson. And these lessons are really focused on conflict resolution, social awareness, uh, building uh, skills that students need at this age. And the, the school resource officer, I mean, uh, school adjustment counselor, along with the school psychologists are developing these lessons. The middle school's also been focusing on restorative practices. It's something that has become a big rock at the middle school and we've seen tremendous success with. The adjustment counselor has almost single-handedly brought this framework to the middle school and is training staff, training uh, students, and we're you know, really hoping that if we continue with that, this model, we'll be able to also train parents and talk with parents about how this framework works and really helps students develop healthy skills for conflict resolution. <coughs> Additionally, the elementary schools have started with universal screenings and that's something that the middle school would also like to 
to take on as an initiative where we would be um, providing opportunities to learn what skills are lagging in students in terms of social emotional readiness and that's something that the adjustment counselor would be helping spearhead. So truly the impact of not having an adjustment counselor I think would globally impact the middle school community. As Dr. McKay said, the, the climate in the building, I've noticed an increase in, in uh, positivity, a little bit less stress with having this person kind of oversee um, the restorative practices and, and additionally supporting the school psychologists. At the middle school also, this position helps with chronic, ab chronic absenteeism, which we just had a meeting this morning with the, four, with the, the school psychologist the adjustment counselor and myself, and it looks like our numbers are trending down when compared to last year in terms of the percentage of students who are chronically absent. And we all know if students are not in school, they're not gonna be able to reach their academic and social potential. The last one may seem minor, but it's really not. To me, the late bus is something that I feel really grateful for every day at four o'clock when I look out my window, well, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, when I look out my window and see the buses pull up and see the middle school kids getting on those buses, my child, was not able to participate in after school activities because I was a teacher, I lived in North Reading, I was a teacher in a, in a local community and I, could, I couldn't get out to pick him up and so he couldn't participate in extracurricular activities. The late bus provides opportunity, it provides access for students who otherwise would not be able to participate in after school activities and extra help. And certainly there are other ways to provide extra help so I, I, I don't wanna say that that's the only way but for children that want to stay after school and get extra help with their teacher, if parents are unable to pick them up, and many are not, the, the late bus provides an opportunity for that. So I, again, in this challenging budget season, I wanted to give it the middle school perspective on what some of these possible reductions would mean. Thank you. Hello. My name is Anthony Lepret, and I'm proud to be the principal of North Reading High School, and I am appreciative of the opportunity to speak to the residents of, of North Reading. You have made our town secondary school campus an amazing place for learning. Students have thrived in a school that now 10 years later looks as it did on opening day in 2014. I'm always gratified to see parents and community members in the school, and I appreciate the smiles on your faces when you walk down Main Street watch a game in the gymnasium or a performance in the Performing Arts Center. Equally, I'm proud to show off our campus to visitors who cannot believe that the school is 10 years old. The school remains a spectacular resource for our young people. You have supported a high school curriculum that offers breadth and depth. Students have been able to take courses that offer greater options as they make college and career choices. From advanced acting to journalism, to coding and web design, our course offerings are relevant and reflect the needs of the workplace of tomorrow. You have recognized the importance of rigorous courses for high school students. Students have benefited from 18 advanced placement course offerings. Considering the junior and senior uh, years for the class of 2023, with respect to advanced placement courses, 255 students scored a three or better, earning course credit in many, uh, earning course credit in many colleges and universities. Considering a single college credit is approximately $1,500, seniors in the class of 2023 saved over a million dollars as they continued their education beyond high school. Assuming a similar success rate, the class of 2024 should save about that same amount. You have modeled creating a community where all students feel connected. Students have established a strong school culture of caring and support where they are genuinely concerned for each other's well-being. Our community is shaped by attentive and caring educators. Your children are in a school where they are known and appreciated. Student participation in clubs and activities remains high. These activities can be transformational. Student councils work, as one example, in the Unified program, is, offers very mem many memorable experiences. And we now participate in unified basketball and bocce and are recognized by the Special Olympics as a champion school. You have valued everyone in our community. Students have been supported in educational models that reflect their levels of need. 
Teachers are able to work closely with students that struggle with varied and often complex coursework. Students with Section 504 accommodations make up about 16% of our student body, and students with diagnosed disabilities that are eligible for individualized education programs consist of about 19% of student body. Students in these two categories alone are greatly impacted by class size, specialized programming, and specialized support. You have recognized that student academic, emotional, and social growth are all important in the development of our young people. Students have been able to learn in an environment that is safe and supportive and allows for educators to provide the necessary time and expertise for the growth of the whole child. We are able to conduct a number of programs to, con to address student mental health uh, wellness, specifically focusing on grade nine and grade 10 student screeners for depression and anxiety. As a component of our crisis intervention protocol, our counseling staff interacts with specific students on a regular basis and also responds to more severe student safety issues as needed. These interactions impact about 10 to 13 percent of our student body. Additionally, general wellness counseling services are required by about 20 percent of the students. You have celebrated student success in the arts and in athletics. Students have competed in contests of physical, intellectual, and creative skills and abilities. They are consistently recognized for their hard work, determination, and success, and many times over have been named champions of the Cape Ann League and in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. North Reading, you have been amazing parents for your children, and you have stood by your neighbor's children as the young people of our uh, town learn and grow. Students have experienced a true benefit growing up in North Reading. Their goals, their accomplishments, their needs, and their expectations are very real. Parents, family members, friends, neighbors, employers, and educators see these realities every day. The ways in which your high school helps your students learn and grow will change if an underfunded budget is deemed acceptable. What you and your children have known and have come to expect will be different. What educators will be able to do for your child's growth and development will look differently. And like you, educators at the high school, we want what is needed for our young people who walk through the doors every day. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for being here this evening. My name is Cynthia Conant, and I'm the Director of Student Services for the District. My goal this evening is to speak to the impact of the proposed reductions, including reduction of the float nurse from 1.0 FTE to 0.5 FTE, as well as the proposed reductions related to adjustment counselors and subsequent impact to special education. Thinking about the impact of reducing the full-time float nurse to part-time, I would ask you to consider the following points. Student safety. One of the primary concerns related to this reduction is the impact to student safety. One of the responsibilities of our float nurse is to provide coverage to the buildings when a nurse is absent. Since hiring the full-time float nurse, we have been able to significantly improve nursing coverage across all, all buildings. The impact of this reduction does not put student safety at the forefront and leaves us vulnerable to periods of time in which a building may be left without proper nursing coverage. This puts both our students and staff at risk. Compliance. The float nurse position also assists with compliance as it relates to collecting required documentation, such as having physicals and immunizations on file. Last year, the float nurse, together with the nursing team, was able to improve com compliance from 30% to 70% across the district. There is no question that having comprehensive student medical information on file helps to ensure district staff are able to support student health needs in the most appropriate way. A reduction in this position does not allow us to continue to strengthen our compliance to ensure we have comprehensive student information on file to ensure proper care. Substitute nurse costs. Currently, the cost of a daily nurse substitute is $200 per day. Over the course of a school year, nurses are required to perform universal screenings, attend field trips, provide classroom education, attend meetings, all of which require a substitute nurse to cover the office. The 
float nurse has been able to effectively cover the offices in these scenarios. A reduction in the float nurse position will likely cause an increase in substitute nurse costs. Additionally, a substitute nurse does not have the same level of familiarity with students and staff. This becomes important to consider when we are talking about providing care for students with medical needs such as diabetes, seizure, seizure disorders, or life-threatening <coughs> allergies, just to name a few. <laughs> Consistency and continuity across buildings. The float nurse has assisted the nurse leader in identifying areas in which we need to ensure consistency with respect to implementation of nursing policy and procedure across all buildings. A reduction in this position only sets us back in terms of continuing to build a cohesive nursing system across the district. With respect to adjustment counselors, as, previous, as previously shared by each of the principals, a reduction in adjustment counselors may result in increased behavioral episodes, a lack of support for crisis intervention, as well as impacts to the culture and climate of the buildings. Further, without the ability to connect students with emotional support and intervention at the time they need it, a potential result is that a student is referred for special <coughs> education services in order to receive support and intervention. This results in inappropriate referrals to special education as well as over-identification and or inappropriate identification of a disability. Impacts to special education. It is likely that we will see an increase in special education referrals, an increase in special education identification rates, an increase in the need for direct services, and potentially an increase in the need for out-of-district placements. Our ability to develop in-district specialized programs to allow students to access their education in the district may become limited. Budgetary increases will likely result from, from, from providing additional services as well as potential tuitions and transportation associated with out-of-district placements. There will also be an impact to staff in terms of increased stress and burnout as caseloads increase. Overall, collectively, all of these proposed reductions are not consistent with our vision of an educational system in which students receive support and intervention at the time they need it. <coughs> Rather, these circumstances leave us vulnerable to a reactive model in which special education becomes the singular path for a student to receive support and intervention. Thank you for your time and consideration this evening. Hi, I'm Dan Downs, Director of digital, digital Learning. As the Director of Digital Learning for North Reading, I stand before you to discuss a critical issue at the crossroads of our educational journey. This isn't just about numbers on a budget, it's about our dedication to our children for a future, domi for a future dominated by digital innovation. Our department has been pivotal in weaving digital tools and literacy into the fabric of our education, especially highlighted by our one-to-one -one program which ensures every student has access to a personal learning device. Yet we face proposed staffing cuts that threaten to unravel these gains, affecting the quality of education and broadening the digital divide for those reliant on school resources. Consider the scope of our mission. We support a digital ecosystem of 2,400 students and over 300 educators across five schools. Our team ensures that the continuity, continuity, security, and efficiency of over 3,000 devices work that's vital for a safe and seamless learning experience. These proposed reductions could significantly impair our capacity to uphold these standards, risking not only operational efficiency, but the security of our learning environments. Digital literacy, a fundamental pillar of our curriculum, is also in jeopardy. In an era where technology permeates every aspect of our life, our students' ability to navigate, evaluate, and innovate within the digital realm is paramount. Yet with fewer hands and minds to drive this mission, the richness of our digital literacy programs may dwindle, potentially leaving our students underprepared for the digital future. Moreover, the collaborative ecosystem we've nurtured, uniting educators, IT specialists, and staff is at risk. The partnership is crucial for integrating technology into our curriculum seamlessly. With reduced staffing, this model of innovation and adaptation 
faces significant threats and po possibly diminishing entirely. Our agility in embracing new educational technologies also is limited. In sharing these concerns, I'm not merely advocating for a department, but for the future of our students and the very essence of our educational system. The proposed cuts to the digital learning and technology department symbolize a retreat from our shared vision of the community con committed to inclusivity, innovation, and excellence. I call upon our community leaders, parents, educators, and stakeholders to reflect deeply on the ramifications of these types of decisions. Let's unite to ensure that our students inherit a learning environment that's not only responsive to today's needs, but also resilient and forward thinking, ready for the challenges and the opportunities of tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. So I just wanted to thank all of our administrative team for their work tonight and also in developing um, our budget for this year. What Michael is about to share in just a moment is sort of our um, reconciliation of a $1.2 million budget gap that's gonna address many of these things. I just wanted to make sure it was clear to everyone that um, this is not a one-year problem. This is not a, a, a fix that's gonna happen um, and, and be solved this year. Some of these decisions, maybe some of the things on this list um, could be substituted out or changed, but we'll be back here next year and the year after revisiting some of these ideas because this is an ongoing issue due to um, the lack of the funding to support the schools as needed. So this is what um, Michael's gonna share with you is our reconciliation, what we've come up with to this point. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll try to move relatively quickly so we can certainly get to discussion and questions, but um, my attempt, I think my colleague on the administrative team just well articulated many of these long-term budget implications reflected here on this slide. And what I'm gonna to attempt to do um, in the next couple of slides is sort of reconcile it, the number piece of that and the FTE piece of that so we can kind of, everyone can kind of recognize what all of the, the potential impacts of reductions of this level of spending would mean, or certainly could mean to the school, the school department. Um, I'm not gonna read these bullets, I think every, that was just very well articulated by my colleagues. So the numbers behind it, um, if we were to put into place some of these long-term budget implications and reductions of spending to that $1.2 million gap from level services to what would be a, a balanced budget within the available revenues. Um, we heard from the elementary school principals and as well articulated the impact and the importance of having class sizes at the optimum levels, 18 to 20 in the primary grades is always gonna have goal, 20 to 22 in the higher level of grades. So if we were to um, move to this spending level, we'd be looking at this level of reduction, three FTE positions, and that would be class sizes that would be at the primary grades in particular that would be above those optimum levels for student learning. We heard from our um, middle school and high school principal, and they've certainly spoken um, about the impact of reductions to classroom teachers at the secondary level as well as to special education teachers and what that would mean for those programs as well as to just the overall breadth and depth of the curriculum and the elective courses and everything that we've certainly prided ourselves here in North Reading at the high school level and the, and the middle school level. Um, we heard from uh, Ms. Conant on the impact of reducing our school nursing services in terms of coverages and our ability to address student health issues across the district. Um, we've certainly heard a lot about this, the reduction of um, school adjustment councils and what, the, number one, the importance of that position, how much we've prioritized adding this level of staffing um, in our strategic plan over the last number of years with the goal of having a designated school adjustment counselor at every school. And this reduction, coupled with loss of ESSER funding, um, would certainly have an impact um, on the mental, uh, certainly the, the mental health issues across the district and the ability to address, address those issues for our students. Um, we just heard from uh, Dr. Downs about the te technology staffing and support and what that would look like and um, also uh, the inability to, of the IT help desk to address um, tech tickets for both student and staff devices would be impacted. 
We talked about the ability of our academic interventionists, and we currently have academic support tutors at the elementary level that work to address these needs and these support systems in those areas of learning loss, particularly in math and ELA, and that would certainly be an impact, our ability to address those early intervention strategies. Um, what we didn't talk about, but there would most likely be a loss to our custodial cleaning staff um, to get to the spending level, and that would certainly raise our ability to not only cover each school's needs, but we would potentially fall behind and we would not be at the optimum levels of sort of a, each cleaner to the proper, uh, appropriate square footage area um, would be impacted. And our ability to cover and move staff around when, when staff is out would be impacted greatly by a reduction to that staffing level. Um, the athletic coaching staff could potentially be impacted and we would have higher students um, to coach race student athletes, to coach ratios, less support and supervision in specific sports could be impacted. Um, and then potential reduction to our classroom support at the kindergarten level. So certainly we've had a long-standing goal, as you've heard tonight, to move to three full-day kindergarten, and we've had an increase in our kindergarten enrollment, and that's anticipated to be the case again next year. And this this reduction could impact our ability to support those classroom teachers um, that we've been able to provide that support, which is so critical at that level. So this first slide talks all about the impacts to personnel services and salaries and, and positions that we have and what those impact statements are, uh, well articulated by my colleagues. The second page represents non-personnel impacts, but impacts that would impact the expense budgets um, across the district. Um, the district school, school and district expense budgets for classroom materials, textbooks, technology, those are already stretched thin and we, we do a lot and we leverage as much as we can and the principals do a great job um, leveraging the funding that we have had. We've seen inflationary increases, um, shipping increases, supply shortage increases that have made that a challenge. We've relied certainly on PTO and PTA um, budgets and support from outside the district for, for enrichment activities and materials <coughs> and technology. So I think it's fair to say not only would that funding be impacted, but maybe more of a reliance on outside support for um, basic classroom materials, which is not what we'd want to do, would be impacted uh, or could be a long-term impact. Um, reduction of our special education transportation um, in budget. So we've increased line items in our proposal to the special education uh, transportation budget to certainly anticipate what those rate increases are expected to be next year from the, our providers as well as to the increase of students both in district and out of district. And what this could do is just add additional risk to that budget and make those line items underfunded. And if those line items aren't funded appropriately and we get into the budget next year, then we have to reallocate um, and that's going to impact budgeting and spending that was meant to be spent on materials or somewhere else elsewhere. So it certainly um, adds risk to the budget. Um, we heard from Dr. O'Connell about the importance and how much um, that secondary school late bus um, has meant for many middle, middle school students. Um, Dr. O'Connell, when I first became business manager here about 10, 11 years ago, was, was we had talked about what if we could ever add a late bus, what that could mean and how important that would be, and we were finally able to do it a couple of years ago, so we, wouldn't, we don't want to take a step back in providing that, that service and what that means for some families that need it. Um, one of the things that we are able to look at now, and we talked about this at the budget webinar, is through the free universal free mails program that's being funded by the USDA as well as the state right now, which is Massachusetts, is one of the states in the nation that continuing to support free mails, lunch and breakfast mails, um, and that's gonna be the case next year, is our participation in our mails program and our school breakfast and lunch program is very, very high. We're over 70%. Where when we had paid mails, we were half that, we were 35%. So our food service account, which we rely on to support our entire food service program, staffing, expenses, food costs, has always been is self-supportive. 
where actually because of anticipation has been so high through this program, which is being funded by the state, so they're getting reimbursement dollars from the state of what we would be receiving if we were charging for, for, um, for our mails. That's now being supplemented through state revenue. Um, but because the anticipation is doubled, we have a much higher revenue. So we now have the ability to support all of our capital cost equipment in, into the future if this program continues, um, as well as we could even look at shifting some indirect costs um, like utilities and cleaning services to our food service account because the revenue has been so high. And that actually does will take less pressure off the operating budget. The risk to doing that is if that free supplemental program ever goes away, it's not guaranteed year to year to be supported by the state budget then it's going to create additional pressure to, that we have to now shift those expenses back into the operating budget. So it's sort of like something that you'd have to watch. Um, the other that area that we've talked about is it could we, um, these reductions at this spending level, could um, we have to look at increased user fees to families for things like busing and extracurricular activities, which we uh, worked hard not to do, and it's been a long-standing school committee goal um, to not, not do that. So before I turn it over to discussion, just in summary, what can we conclude from the budget proposals that the administration has kind of presented at this point through several meetings and as well as tonight? So we are in the process of sort of turning this budget over to the school committee for discussion that ultimately has the uh, ability to appropriate and uh, approve a budget. as. Chairman Buckley mentioned earlier, we have not had a school committee workshop yet, so they are hearing from all um, the administration, they're hearing from, they'll hear from many of the community members tonight, and as well as the administrative team. But what we have put on the table for their consideration is spending levels that we would represent in balanced budget, that's at 3.9%. A level services budget, continuing the same level of services, which is 7.1%, again, higher than what's been typical in North Reading because of these higher cost drivers, like higher fixed costs and higher contractual salary obligations and higher special education costs, all things that not just North Reading is dealing with, is that drivers across the state. Um, and, um, that's that spending level. And then what we would recommend, some modest enhancements to level services to fund an additional 1.6 FTE position, school adjustment counselor and an academic interventionist across the district. Um, as well as free full day kindergarten and a modest increase to our maintenance budget to help us address some unforeseen costs that we've really started to see um, you know, pop up over the last couple of years as the elementary schools kind of age and so forth. So some quick bullets, you can read them. Uh, certainly the balanced budget does not fund level services, reduction to staffing and educational services well articulated by my colleagues this evening. Potential increases to user fees, but it, certainly meets our contractual obligations to um, for salaries and our fixed cost increases um, and it would meet the current revenue plan and available revenues available for fiscal 25 level services we would meet our current level services it does add staff to meet an increase of about 60 students at the elementary level to maintain um, the class sizes that we've always tried to maintain in the primary grades um, does not include uh, any reductions to our existing staff of services, does not add staff reflected in our strategic plan. It does restore and maintain those ESSER positions that were well talked about um, this evening um, with our Florida nurse, um, two school adjustment counselors, and a technician. It does meet our contractual obligations, um, and it does continue with a tuition-based full day kindergarten program. So we would not have three full day kindergarten. And that has a budget shortfall of $1.2 million. And then the budget that we've revised slightly tonight by reducing that by 346,000 from what we presented on March 9th. Um, and that certainly does everything we just talked about in level services, but it also includes some, some enhancements for our uh, mental health and early intervention strategies with the academic interventionists in the 0.6 increase of the school adjustment counselor, as well as achieve free full day kindergarten. So that's the difference. And that has a budget gap of about 1 million, a little more than 1.5 million. So with that being said, uh, I'm gonna open up the floor to discussion. I know it was a long, long presentation. 
and um, we can talk. We'll open up for questions, and then we can talk the next steps as we move forward. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Thank you to all the administrators for their comments tonight. I also want to recognize two of the select board members that are here. Thank you for coming, and the town administrator as well. So, as I said at the beginning, I want to begin with comments or questions from the school committee, and then anybody that's on the Google Meet or in the room, if you're in the room, we set up a podium just for you guys, so feel free to go up to the podium. Um, I have a million questions and comments, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push all the override stuff to later on. I'm going to let you guys ask first, but specifically about where the cuts are being made and because, again, there's no guarantees of what we can, will or will not get, and so I'm curious of questions or comments that the committee has on the proposal here. Mr. Friedman, you look like you want to start. I do, but I have. <laughs> uh, ladies first. I'll go. Yes, go for it. Go for it. Go ahead. Um, anyhow, I just wanted to again say thank you to everyone for the presentation. Um, Mr. Connolly, always thank you so much for the work that you put into this. It makes it like clear as a bell um, as to where we're standing and, and where the where the needs are. Um, and this presentation has been comprehensive and wonderful. But I will say, if you're here every every other week, like we are, you you would see that we we get this we get a little bit of this every week. We see like what's being done. For example, like with Dr. Downs giving his digital learning presentation and just seeing like how critical um, that those new positions are. We like to lose to lose positions that we now have become essential would. Um, it's just very sobering to see. Um, and so I really appreciate everyone's, everyone's um, presentation. My um, big question looking at, um, looking at the, at the um, potential reductions is, uh, you know, we're looking at, like, again, really sobering things on reduction of classroom teachers, special ed. What are what is based on reti like retirement? Like, are there are there positions that are people are retiring or <coughs> leaving for or like how much of that is represented here? That's a great question. I think there's certainly a part of that that is represented here. So we would we always try to have the, the least impact on existing staff. So that we do have annually we do have attrition. We do have retirements. So that's an area we always turn to and look to see how we can um, re reallocate those resources and make a reduction that is appropriate that would not impact an existing staff member. So I think it's well, that's certainly a part of these reductions. Okay, but no idea, no, you couldn't say like, oh, there's, you know, I'm looking at the top line with the three mm -hmm. um, FT for the elementary school. Like, is that, is that, I just, does that mean that someone needs to be, lose their job. It's That's probably two to three. I'd yeah. Two to three total. Two to three all across the board. Correct. Right. Out of yeah. the 15, yep. Yeah. So two, just to be clear, so two to three you think would be people that have positions right now that would not have positions next year? No, the opposite. Okay. That, that two to three would be retirees. retirees. Retirees, and we're looking at about 12 people who have positions right now not having positions next yeah. year. Some of these are reductions in FTE, so. Correct. Okay. Right. okay. That was one of my questions to you, too. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Other questions on that? Not right now. I know you have. Oh. I, know, I cut off Jeff. No, no, Mr. Friedman, why don't you go next? Sure. sure. Um, so, adjustment counselors, obviously there are mandated uh, requirements for IEPs and 504s. I'm assuming that the reductions we're talking about uh, mean we still meet those requirements because they're mandated by law and we have to, and that ultimately the reductions impact basically the myriad of other things that they do um, but we still meet minimal services or required services for uh, for our students is that i don't want to put words in anybody's mouth but i assume that's true sure. yeah, so i to answer your question yeah. um, any iep that we have that's signed and agreed to is a legal document right. and required to provide those services um, just a clarifying Daly in his slide went through some of the differences between the roles of the counselors. Right. And so the adjustment counselors are our personnel who are getting at the root cause in a proactive way as opposed to reacting to a situation that is happening. Um, so any student with a signed IEP, we 
are required by law to provide those services. Right. That's no yeah. That's where I was going. It's yeah. no no child is suddenly going to be left high and dry on their IEP and on any way is, has a lot of other impacts, but we still are meeting those sorts of requirements. Correct. The one, yeah. the one thing I would add, just we've always been very close with our ratios of nurses, with the number of students in our buildings. The floater nurse has allowed us uh, to approach that and to, and to lessen some of those um, ratios. So that's, that is a mandate that we're, we're always close on. Um, just want to throw that out to you. Um, yeah, I've got, I got plenty more, so. <laughs> no, get, get them on the table. Let's yeah, just go ahead. I mean. Um, so, mentioned a bunch of times our class sizes. Um, do we have proposed class sizes for each of these budgets as to what they would look like? So, in other words, um, I completely get the fact that we, A, don't want to go with uh, higher class sizes. Uh, but each of these would have impact to class size. Do we have a estimated impact per budget as to what we think those class sizes would be? We do, yeah, that's a good question. So at the elementary level, um, under our existing level services budget, we would be experiencing class sizes in those key grades at K kindergarten through grade two, the primary grades where we try to keep them at, um, less than 20 or, or, or below. We are currently around 17 to 18 per class. With these reductions, we would go to 22, potentially 23, as high as 22 or 23. And just, just to be clear, with the balanced budget, you're saying? No, on the balanced budget. What you're saying, for the balanced, the balanced budget, you would go budget. to? The, fir the first, first column. The first these are reductions to get to the first column. Correct. The Correct. Balanced budget. And the second column, then I assume, would, would stick to around 17 to 18? At the secondary level? Um, 19, yeah. eight, yeah. 17, no, 18, 17 to 19. 17 to 19, sorry. Okay. On the level services budget. On level services. Yeah. And then for the final one, does that have any impact on, I mean, it's not as much of a difference, but does that have any impact on the class sizes? Like, does it go down further? I assume not really. Um, so you, you're talking about the general classroom kindergarten support? Well, for, for the revised modified mm -hmm. level services budget, the 8.1% column. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Does that, does that have any associated impact to class size? Yeah. Yeah. Not, not directly, but with those positions, interventions, coaches, right. we're always talking about ratios. So when you walk in an elementary classroom, you're often seeing two or three adults working with smaller groups of kids. Right. Um, this enables that more systematically. Got it. Questions, Mr. Friedman, or oh, I thoughts? do. But why don't why don't you get take one, <coughs> Mr. McGowan? I wanted to ask about the floater nurse. Uh, if the if that position is reduced or eliminated, it sounds like we'll need to rely more on on um, substitute nurses uh, as needed. Uh, obviously, that has a cost impact as well. But the other question I have is what, how successful are districts at being able to fill those substitute nurse positions? Yeah. And one follow up. Just one follow up, Mrs. Conant. You, when you were talking about the school nurse, you had mentioned previously we were only in 30% compliance with the law, which is concerning to me as a school committee member. And now we're at 70% compliance. Can you speak a little bit more about those sort of compliance issues?
so the workflow associated with that is a lot of outreach to parents to you know, obtain um, physicals or immunizations. When I first started in the, in the district, we didn't have a float nurse or a nurse leader. So some of these things were not coming to the surface. Um, but between the combined effort of the float, the floater nurse, and the nurse leader, they really tackled this issue. And um, as I stated in my impact statement, you can't underestimate the impact of having comprehensive student information on file. Um, we're dealing with medical needs at that level. We're not you know, talking about teaching and learning. We're talking about medical, which is very different. Um, you know, Some teachers by nature might be able to counsel a little bit. Some counselors by nature might be able to teach a little bit. But none of us have a medical background. It's just a very unique and distinct skill set. Right. So that's why I keep getting that email from the school nurse. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm pretty sure I got one too. Um, yeah, I'm gonna that's a, I'm gonna just follow up real quick. Yeah, no. This is not this is not a nurse question. This is a floating question. Um, with the reduction in the school adjustment counselor, I assume that that would create a more of a floating adjustment counselor because I think we've done that in the past. Is that right? So would is that what we would be would we be having, for example, an adjustment counselor that's going to all three elementary schools? Like, how, what would that look like? There'd probably be some shared models, yeah. Shared shared middle high, shared elementary, those type of ideas that we had to make those kinds. Yeah. Well can we can we can we a little bit more specifically, right now if we keep level services or the mod can you talk about like how many we have right now for the schools at level services versus the revised modified versus the balanced budget? Um, so I believe we have correct me if I'm wrong, two at the high school. Yep. Two at the high school, one at the middle school. Mm -hmm and two and a half at the elementary school. Okay. Um, correct? All right. So re the reduction, a potential long-term reduction of losing two school adjustment counselors, we would be going from where we really want to be, which is adding a .5, so this, we have a total of six. Um, so the revised modified would add it so that each school has one and the high school has two. Correct. Mm -hmm. Level services would keep it as it is currently? Correct. Just and then yeah. balance would be removing two of removing them. Removing two. So we'd be down to uh, three and a half total. <laughs> Across five schools. Across five schools. Okay. Thank you. And I cut you off, Mr. McGowan. That's right. I'm good. I did. Um, <clears throat> I'll jump in with a couple. So <clears throat> the. <clears throat> what do I want to call? <laughs> <clears throat> well, I guess on the same line custodial cuts. Um, I believe that some of these, like but this one we're probably talking about is one that was being partially funded by ESSER funds. And so what would the custodial cuts leave us at for the number of custodians in the buildings? Is this just somebody to, and similar to the nursing issue, is this a situation where if we cut a position, we're then gonna be paying a lot more overtime as well? Correct. Yeah, so it, it does, it's sort of a double-edged sword in a way. So we do, we were able, um, and there's currently no custodial position in the SR funding. There was there was when SR there was before was okay. in fiscal 21. Okay. And then over time that got shifted, um, and we kept those four positions in SR in 23 and 24. Okay. Um, so we do have a floater custodian that functions similar to in some ways the floater school nurse, where it, they they certainly cover, and we don't have a full complement of staff, so they do help us reduce the coverage need. Mm -hmm. And then they do have an area that they clean. Um, so it's certainly the loss of that position, we would go from 20 <laughs> custodians to 19. And it would just be more less coverage needs, maybe more overtime. And um, the inability for us to kind of address when we don't have a full staff and um, to provide those cleaning ratios would be impacted and services could, could be impacted. Okay. And there certainly would be an increase in overtime as well. A um, couple similar notes. One, the assistant coaches. I think that's something that's, it, Dr. Daly and I came in the other day to talk to students on, we're doing their civic action projects, and one student was specifically concerned about the, um, the, 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 the inability that we've had to hire um, a, an athletic trainer. And 
one concern I would have is if we're cutting coaches or assistant coaches, that's also a safety issue because now we have, you know, more students with less supervision, less trained people there. And so I think we just have to be very careful about, I mean, if, if the level of participation can support it, that's one thing, but if not, we have to be very careful about cutting that, especially when we haven't even been able to fill the position of the athletic trainer. And so that would just be a concern. And a similar concern, special education costs a lot of money. I mean, it costs a lot to educate students with needs. And a lot of what we've tried to do the last few years is to add positions to stop students from needing to go, to go out of district, to start to address issues earlier on, to stop them becoming longer issues. And a lot of the cuts we're talking about here are going to in the short term, they might save us a little bit of money, but they are very much setting us up for more costs in the future. And it's just concerning. I mean, I, I'm not disagreeing with where we have to make the cuts necessarily, but it's just challenging because it's one of those things where we save money for a year or two, and then in a couple years, we're gonna be hearing presentations about how we have so many more students needing special services and those services cost a lot more and we save a little bit of money today and we cost it costs a lot more later on. My, my, my first year on the school committee, we talked a lot about adding some positions to address special education earlier on and pretty much immediately we started seeing fewer outplacements of, of students and we're just going back on that. And so it's, it's, a, concerning, it's a concerning trend. Um, I have more other questions. I'm going to go back around. Mr. Friedman, you want to you know, any other no. comments, questions? Um, <coughs> not right now. Mr. Friedman? Uh, yeah, I mean, more, I guess it's less of a question, but more of just an, uh, an open comment just to make sure we're, we're considering impact, not just to grade level, but also to, to specific schools. As we look at this, I think uh, I just want to make sure we're, we don't have disparate impact uh, to any specific school. I don't want the, the hood or the little or, or any one school to feel anything more or unnecessary. Um, that it sort of sp unfortunately spread the, I'd say the wealth, but it's more the misery. Yeah. Um, and again, there's not really a question there, but just more of a, of a comment. And I'm sure we'll do that. but. Uh, we just need to be careful as we look at this. It's not just positions, it's not just grades, it's also how does it spread out across schools. Mm -hmm. I think the rest of my co comments are more forward looking, so I think okay. it, we should probably <coughs> still focus on, on these cuts yep. until, we, until we get the feedback. So I have a few more comments on this specific budget. So uh, the first thing is, uh, Mr. Connolly, can you explain a little bit in the various models here, what's happening with kindergarten in particular? Because one thing that I would say is we're down to 15 districts out of 351 towns and cities that make their students pay for full day kindergarten. And that number is gonna go down even further. And so um, we have to look at that regardless of what happens from the budgetary standpoint. Um, so I know we have a, rev uh, a revolving fund for I always said the wrong word for this, but like for the uh, kindergarten fees. Um, can you talk a little bit about, obviously in the, the revised modified level services, there's no more user fee for parents, but can you talk a little bit about how it's being drawn down with a revolving fund? Yeah. And, 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 and I think we should even think about, I, I don't immediately want to say we take off even reducing the kindergarten fee, even if is just level services because we have to get rid of that fee eventually. So, um, but can you talk a little about the revolving fund? Yes, good question. So we've obviously been charging a tuition fee for a number of years for a full uh, day kindergarten. Um, there's been a huge movement across uh, the state really over the last seven or eight years where many districts have moved to free full day kindergarten in the slide that Dr. Daly showed earlier, I believe it was 15 districts remain in the Commonwealth out of 300 that is still charging a tuition. Many like us have recognized the importance of providing that access at that level, um, and they have tried to either phase in a reduction of that um, 
tuition fee, um, and we have uh, certainly done that since fiscal 21, as Dr. Daly showed, where we were at $4,250, now we're at $2,500. Um, so we, we take in this tuition, and over time, there's certainly been a little bit of a reserve that's built up in that revolving account. So what we are trying to do by our recommendation to get to free full day kindergarten for next year, and there's been a long, um, we certainly have, that's been on our strategic plan to be free by fiscal year 2025, um, to sort of lessen or moderate that impact. If we were to just go right to the full impact, it would be $450,000. So we're trying to take that true impact because we do have a reserve of funds and um, moderate that each year. So maybe it would be the impacts $200,000 next year and then maybe that is only 100,000 and 50,000 so by the, and we could, as we spend down that reserve. We could spend that entire reserve next year to make that impact zero, um, but then, then we're right back to where we are the, the following fiscal year. So similar to how we dealt with the SR funds, right where we tried to do that moderately, over the, spend that over the few years that we had it available. With this reserve of funding available, we're trying to do the same thing to achieve the goal and the objective to be free, um, but to not make it such a high impact in one, in one year. Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think overall not setting up financial cliffs has been one of our goals here. Um, and I think that's where we're at right now. <laughs> so a few other comments. Um, number one, when, one of the reductions was increasing the user fees i do think on the bus fee we should look at uh, increasing that either way because the bus is getting more expensive and the reality is we talked about that last year we did a mo we we passed on just the increase of the actual that we were seeing last year and i think we have to unfortunately look at that again this year um, regardless of what's happened because if that saves something saves a couple of assistant coaches or whatever i think it's worth thinking about that <laughs> I, I saw you put in 50000 for the food service funds. I wonder if, you know, it's one of those things where you don't want to rely on it year to year. You don't want to be paying, yeah. you know, e even if we can, I, I know there's restrictions on what it can be used for. Correct. But even beyond that, you have to be careful about using something that's not guaranteed to, to pay for, you know, recurring funds. But there are some funds there that I, I, I think we should consider it's another way where to look before we cut you know an adjustment council or something like that um, <clears throat> just a couple last quick comments um, one thing to note here is even though you know salaries go up everything's going up when we look year over year this is my seventh year on the committee the percentage that is salaries is almost identical as it was seven years ago so the reality is everything is going up it's not salaries are going up and nothing else is going up. It's the same ratio as it was seven years ago. And so it's literally been like 82.8, 82.9, 82.7. It's basically the same because everything is going up in almost the same ratios here. <clears throat> and just one thing to note, like we, we talked about possibly 12 people losing jobs or you know, losing parts of these positions. The other thing to think about is those people are not only trusted adults in the building, but they're also volunteers for other things. I mean, just thinking about, I mean, this hit me with Mr. Downs because he brought in the person from the, from the tech room, but that's a volunteer for, you know, the, the maskers. And so like all of these people in the schools are, are people that donate their time outside, above and beyond as well. And that's the other thing that's just frustrating about people losing positions, so. Um. <clears throat> I won't get into the broader part, but that's that's my comments about the specifics right now of the budget and where I think we still have to look a little bit at if we can save a couple positions here or there. I'd love to try to. And and to your point on everything about that ratio being consistent, looking back at one of the, the original preliminary budget slide that shows the percentage increase impact of each uh, department where salaries the percentage increase is 7.5%. That's against the total budget. But if you calculate these increases against their previous budget, like in transportation, we have a $140,000 increase over last year's budget. Last year's budget was 400, or the current year's budget was 472,000. That's an increase of almost 30%. That's right. Yep. So, I mean, that's, a, you know, the, whereas the salary increase for the year was 9%. 
Uh, obviously, salaries have the bigger impact, but that, to your point, that's right. how those numbers are staying consistent. We're just seeing really big increases in a couple of other line items. Tuition is the other big one, 14% increase yeah. year over year on tuition. So. And, and I want to be clear on the, on the Mr. Downs one, uh, Dr. Downs person. Like I, I'm not talking about what positions are being cut or anything like that, just saying overall. The point is all of these various people we run into have different positions in the district and are the volunteers that stay after and you know, help out with all these various things. And so it's just, yeah. Public comments, questions, anybody? Don't have to, this go and, and just to speak to, if you wanna put up Mr. Connolly, the next yeah. slide here. Yeah. Just to speak to, the, the point today is really to get out what the cuts would be if, if we just go with the, uh, the balanced, you know, budget from what we have right now from the revenue sources. My goal, I will say that very clearly, my goal is to hope that the town will vote for an override so that we don't have to do this because everything else is going up more than 2.5%, health insurance going up double digits, multiple years. Uh, one of the slides Mr. Connolly shows, fixed cost in the school has gone up 22% over the last four years and revenue goes up 2.5% every year. And so I hope we don't get to that point, but tonight is really to get the school side of this out, the override, what we're talking about on Wednesday night is the finance planning team is going to present to all of the boards, the school committee, the select board, the finance committee, the capital improvement um, uh, committee about what we've been working on and we'll pre present a hope of what we would like to do for an override um, to address multiple years. I there's people here that will shoot me if I give any information on that, so I will not <laughs> give any information out about that, but that will be discussed on be Wednesday possible. about what the hope is, but the clear thing is the school has, side, has challenges, the municipal side has challenges, the capital projects have challenges as well, if you've noticed every time you drive by Chestnut Street. And so <laughs> there are lots of things that we need to address. Wednesday, we're gonna, the boards are gonna be talking there. And we've already set up a couple of informational meetings where if people want to come in and talk more about this, um, a webinar is the first one, and then you know an in-person one, and more can be added later on as well. But that's sort of where we're at in terms of next steps. Any comments or questions? Just, I mean, and pretty, pretty much much. most of the people in this room have heard me say it, and this is uh, sort of where. Uh, where Mr. Buckley was going, is uh, the town has a revenue problem. <laughs> we have a bigger revenue problem. And uh, we're talking about the impact here. Capital Projects has the same. We all, we, this is across the board. There's a, there is a revenue problem here. And uh, one of the things that uh, Dr. Daly said briefly, but I want to hit home again, even if we solve it now for this year, we're back here every year uh, until something changes. Uh, so the variable in this instance would be the override, uh, but without something changing, these things will keep being a problem, so. Mrs. Kopke, wanna unmute? Can you unmute? Yeah, I just wanna thank everyone for their time and effort this is always a very depressing time of year, having been on the school committee. And I just want to say thank you for your time and effort and look forward to the town coming together to do what they need to do to support our budget. Thank you. Julie, do you want to give your name and address for Cindy? Yeah, 5 Elvira Road. Thank you. Julie Kopke. Okay. If there are no other comments or questions, I will. Ah, Mr. Gilberto, oh, come on up. Yeah. Mr. Sutherland's coming up. You have to at least grab a microphone if you're going to do it. Yeah. Come on up. Can you go first? It's just, yeah. Name and address. Hi, uh, Tim Sutherland, 17 Maple Road. I guess two comments. Um, I think one important thing, and I think a, a few of the folks uh, brought it up, was you know access. I noticed in the budget, you know, we had the late bus, which I know a lot of the middle schoolers use every day, right, for jazz band, um, you know, all the, the performances that we do in town, athletics, everything. 
Uh, $15,000 seems like a fairly small number in a $40 million budget, so I guess I would ask everybody to maybe look at that. I mean, just the number of kids that use that every, every day. Um, that would be really helpful. And I guess on the, on the three column, kind of the menu chart that was laid out here, um, yeah, that, perfect. Um, I think it's really hard, and this goes across all the town budgets that we've been kind of looking at this year, it's really hard for people around town to understand level services and modified level services. So I guess I'd ask the committee and the administration to look at what would our budget be in totality so that the town really understands what we're asking for in this. The next month is gonna be really hard to get people to understand what we're doing. Um, so I think it's really, really hard to kind of bounce back and forth and say, well, if it's this on the menu or that on the menu, do I know what I'm voting for when I get to town meeting in June? Um, and then I guess back to the one point on the access too, looking back at the, you know, the tuition-based kindergarten, again, I think what's really important for this town is a lot of the under um, kids that need to go to kindergarten aren't going, and I think we're seeing that in the numbers that when we lower these fees, we're seeing more kids in kindergarten, which really means that's a portion of the community that needs it the most. So I, I would uh, you know, ask the committee to look at that as well as we kind of drive in. I think Wednesday is gonna be a really hard meeting. I really appreciate, I'm sure there was a lot of sleepless nights getting to this, um, and there's gonna be a lot more getting to, uh, to June town meeting. So definitely appreciate all the hard work that went in this, but just maybe two things to consider as we get towards uh, the May, May meeting and where we uh, bring it, put it in the uh, warrant for the town. Thank you, Mr. Sutherland. And our town administrator, Michael Gilberto. <clears throat> Thank you through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Michael Gilberto here in my capacity as town administrator. Um, first, I uh, just want to echo the sentiment that you know, we are working together in the financial planning team. I think I say that on behalf of um, the select board chair and Ms. Manny Pelly, we're here this evening. Um, I will just also add um, for the edification of folks at home and who are following your meetings, um, we have similar challenges on the municipal government um, side of the budget. Um, they're not quite as dramatic in this upcoming fiscal year, um, but they are, are significant when we look towards the future years. So, um, you know, you're not alone in the challenges. And again, I think it, that's why it's so important that we all continue to work together. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Mrs. Leanders. Is that how I say it? Leanders? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Jennifer Leanders, 28 Heritage Way. Um, I have a couple process questions, but thank you so much for all your presentations really insightful and um, really helped to understand. Uh, Dr. Daly mentioned at the beginning that parents want more support in literacy and math. Is there a reading specialist in each school currently and a math specialist? Dr. Daly? Sure. Do you want to speak to that? Um, currently at the elementary schools, there's one professional that serves Specialist, if you wanted to call that for interventions in literacy, I think at one of the elementary schools the title is um, the academic interventionist, and that's where that model came through. Where they're serving both okay. and math, but both the Hood and Little School also have that support from Title I math tutors, which Dr. Daly referenced that we are on the cusp of hopefully carrying over for another year, but we could lose some of that funding. Okay, so so there so there is it one in each school? Is it one at the batch and one shared by the hood and one person one. in each school, but they serve in different roles. Okay. And then there's shared FTEs, like within that, if I'm correct, right? At the, am I right? There's like 1.5 technically reading specialist yeah. academic interventionist, and I think there's 2.0. Is that correct at the little school? 1.8. 1.8. <laughs> Okay. That's how it gets down to it. Okay. <laughs> so if I could uh, just answer. So our goal would be to have the one at each school at, at minimum. Yeah. The interventionist at each school at minimum and the literacy coach is sort of the plan. That's the math. That's the full plan for NRPS 2025. So this is every year when we introduce modified level services. Yep. We're introducing a piece of the larger plan. Okay. So that would be with the 8.1. You'd want one at every. Even, even because you, you go ahead multiple years to try okay. to get to everything. So that's the, the ultimate goal is to have. So if, if the school doesn't have the reading specialist, but they've got an interventionist, it would probably be the opposite that we'd go with most likely. Okay, great. And I noticed in, in everyone's impact statements, they talked about social emotional learning and the adjust, adjustment counselors. Um, 
I think it was referred to as restorative practice. And um, you said it changed the climate at the middle school. Can you tell me more about what that is? And could anyone else do it, some of the other counselors that were listed? Mm -hmm. So historically, before restorative practices, when two students had conflict, we would often separate them, and, and that would be our approach. You know, consequences if necessary, but separate, just stay away. <clears throat> restorative practices have changed that, completely flipped it, where we're, we're really working on restoring any harm that may have been done, helping students have dialogue around the conflict, and being able to move forward, maybe not as but certainly coexist and, and think of a better lifelong skill. That's a reactive part of it. There's also a proactive part where there are community circles, similar to maybe the elementary school model where they have morning meeting and there's a circle. And so we're having circles with middle school students around proactive topics just to build community. Yeah. That's amazing. I feel like that's a big statement, changing the climate at a middle school, which seems like a, probably a, a difficult climate to change. And then just a process question. So on April 22nd, I think it said, can you go to the last slide? The school committee votes, and then that budget will be the one that's brought to town meeting on June 10th from these so, three choices. Yeah, so, so the goal will be that we will have two budgets for town okay. meeting. One will have to be with no additional revenue. We mm -hmm. have a revenue plan that we worked with the finance planning team on that that will be a goal of like that's the balanced budget okay so that will be ready to go now truthfully the school has a little more wiggle room than the than the municipal side because we don't actually go line by line so we could you know over the summer if somebody retired or moved or something like you could uh, adjust things slightly but the idea is there will be a balanced budget that is presented at town at June town meeting. If an override passes were to pass, there will also be a budget that we know how much would be going to the municipal side, how much would go to the school, and we would know these are the positions that will um, be saved essentially from from that. Now the challenge is Dr. Daly's raised a couple of times is educators have to get notice of yeah. of layoffs, and they're based on their seniority depends on when those are. So there theoretically could be people that we have to notify that they would be losing a position. Um, some of those notifications come shortly after town meeting. So possibly we could avoid that. Mm -hmm. Although I should also clarify from a procedural standpoint, town meeting is not the only thing that is needed to pass an override. There's also, there would also be a ballot vote in town. So. I believe we're talking about the first step being a town a town meeting vote, and if that were to pass shortly thereafter, a ballot vote as well. If but you, if, both. You, if you can imagine a, the, the actual budget vote, will I believe what we've talked about, and I don't know what will finally be, you know, will be basically like a two line, a two column budget. Okay. This is without a, any additional. B. What's that? Plan A, Plan B. Exactly. Without okay. any additional revenue. And, and, and with the, the proposed uh, budget override that we, we'd like the town to vote on. So would that be the first column and then the second or the third? We, I, we would, I, I don't believe at that point we would have a third column. Right? No, 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 I'm saying the second or yes, the third. One, one of those yeah. two, correct. Yes, correct. exactly, some, okay. some balance of that. Right, yeah. okay. Right, that's what, that's, that's what some of the next meetings are going to be about, that's whether exactly. it's second or third column, but <laughs> yes. I, I, I think it would probably be the third column. I think that's probably what we would be especially hoping for from the school side and the kindergarten. Yeah, and, as, and again, especially like that might be something that the community wants. I mean, every time I've run for re-election, I've been told by about 17 people we need to get rid of the kindergarten fee, and so. And actually, Katie, just, said, Katie says it to me 15 of those 17 times. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, one more question, actually, involving the kindergarten. You talked about a revolving fund. 
So what is that, and could more of that money be used to save positions? So you, user fees, I'll let Michael talk a little bit more, but like when the user fees come in, they have to be re received into an account. Mm -hmm. And so the expenses from year to year can vary. So there's usually a little bit of a balance. So some years you might have fewer kindergartners, you have fewer fees, okay. and so that you might have to dip into that. But the point is, over the number of years we ha we've had these fees, it, there's a balance in that account still that can, would need to be drawn down. It can only be used to cover the cost of the kindergarten, though. Okay, so, so okay. Yeah. 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 It couldn't be used to cover a different position, so. What about the paras? <clears throat> so it can be used to cover all the direct costs of the program, which would be the classroom teachers and the paraprofessionals it, okay. that work within that program. Correct. Right. But, but again, this is where, like, <clears throat> the challenge is funding. Again, you could... An argument could be made that for one year is better than none, you know, and then you get rid of it after that year. But yes, that that is a point that it could be. Yeah, the the so. the, the metaphor that I've been running through my head t tonight for some reason is if you ever if you follow football at all, professional football and their salary cap, you can do anything under a salary cap for one year. It's it's what about the next year and the next year? And so there are probably <laughs> things we could do for one year to make the pain a little bit less, but. Uh, the, the overall structural problem doesn't go away and it becomes worse year after year. So, okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. If there are no more questions and I see no more comments or questions, I will close this public hearing. Thank everybody for coming. The, I'm going to take a three minute break, but um, <laughs> we have 18 pages of policies coming up if anybody wants to stay and listen to Very policies. Exciting. but. I would give people a minute or two if they don't want to stay, but Thank I'm going to take a three-minute uh, break. Thank you, everybody. Yep.
Ready to go, oh, Gabby? Yeah. Pizzas? Just FYI. Uh, we bring in pizzas? No. We have a cater. Did you say we're good, Dr. Daly? No. It's no. still saying muted. I just want to, I don't know if people at home can hear us. I don't know. Is anybody at home we know? Mm. HC, is that you, Heidi? Catherine Fallon, that, this is Anna Pelli. What's going if on? If you guys can hear us, let us know. Excuse me. <laughs> Or any of you really? Hmm. This what's feeding that? This one? Yeah. <laughs> this one. Can I type comments on here or not? Uh, my, it wasn't coming up for me. Are you trying to comment? Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. Turned off. <clears throat> my, my bladder screwed up the meeting. Broke our momentum. I know. No, no, they can't get the audio back on on Google Meet now. You, you got out and you got that in, right? Uh huh. We'll just use. We'll just use. We'll just use. We'll just use, we'll just use, we'll just use Reverb. I'm gonna turn that off. I, I think we can start. I'll go. I'll go see if I can hear it. I'll, uh, <coughs> okay. I hope people at home can hear us. I don't think they can. So no. I just said your mic is off. Yeah, did somebody just say it? Was there a comment on there? Did you say? Some, uh, I, I thought I saw something. There. You need to speak. Oh, so that, I can oh, that, oh that was. Okay. No. Can, you hear, can, can you hear us, Dr. Daly? Trying to see if, we're trying to see if you guys can hear us at home. It doesn't look like you can. Uh, yeah, if they, if they While we wait, <coughs> Mr. Buckley's going to in, uh, sing for us. Yeah. Isn't that yeah. great? <laughs> I'm, I'm still, I'm still, I'm still on the meeting. I know. They probably just forgot to hang up. They probably out. forgot to hang up. <laughs> they went to have dinner. <laughs> <laughs> they all fell asleep. <laughs> if anybody can hear me making horrible jokes, raise your hand. Anything? <laughs> so you want to unplug I'm that? When we went to break, and I'm just having trouble unmuting, and I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Do you want to just turn that off and then just turn one computer on? Yeah, I'm just going to do that. So yeah, just give me just hit pause. <laughs> I'll take care of it. <laughs> Do you want me to turn the my computer on then? Because I'm kind of more central. Sure. But only after this is off. Yeah, let's just wait for this to be off. Does your computer have a, a microphone that will be omnidirectional or I probably not. No. Alright, let's use my use my use my use my Okay, we're having technical difficulties after going on mute. Can anybody at home hear us? Somebody raise your hand if you can hear us at home. Okay. Somebody raise your hand, yes, good. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. We're good to go. So we resume the meeting. We have a bunch of policies for first readings and I'll turn it over to the policy subcommittee to lead us in that. Yeah, I'd, I'd prefer not to have to read each one of these. Um, you don't have to read the whole policy. Yeah. <laughs> um, why don't we just, yeah. just to get through this quickly, why don't we do a motion to approve for a first reading each one, have a second, then we can comment on it? Yeah, that's fine. You want to do it that way? Yeah. Do we, okay. Are we doing each policy at a time? Yep. Or? Yes. Yeah, you do have to. Yeah, we have to do each policy separately. But. So do a motion, do a second, and then we'll comment. So um, the first policy is uh, DIFBA, uh, uh, dealing with audits uh, and <laughs> financial audits. Um, so someone want to make a motion? Why don't you go ahead and make, why don't you make a yeah, motion? Yeah. You two could do it. Yeah. yeah. Motion to, uh, to accept first reading of DIFBA. Uh, second. OK, we have a motion for first reading. We have a second. Any discussions on this? My only comments were what I said when we were coming in here. <laughs> School district, I think, should be capitalized throughout. District should be capitalized throughout. Superintendent should be capitalized throughout. Committee should be school committee, at least the first time as a defined term, just so we're consistent amongst all these policies. So that would be my only change. I had no substantive changes. Anybody else have anything? No. Anybody upset with my capitalization? No. Only if you're going to do it for each one. <laughs> um, I will, I will make that comment, so. Okay, so we have a motion. 
second. In a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 4-0. Uh, next one is, uh, next policy is DJ, uh, expenditure of funds. Uh, so this motion is to accept the first reading for policy DJ expenditure of funds. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Any comment on this? <coughs> My only question here was, it says the school committee will follow its adopted budget as closely as possible in expenditure, expenditure of funds. So school committee does not have to go line by line. We can allow changes to the policy within the year. And usually Dr. Daly and Mr. Connolly do an excellent job of reallocating as we need. I'm just, I, was, I read this two or three times last night and, and I was just wondering, is this, tr is this trying to say that we, we have to go line by line in the budget? No. And stay with no, that? Or is this- Absolutely not saying that. It has just staying three, within the dollar. Okay. Three very specific instances <coughs> that you have to okay. vote for after the budget has been approved. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that, because I thought that was the whole gist of this, is that like you have to stay within the dollar amount of the budget? Yeah, beyond, yeah after you've approved the budget, these are the three things you can do to increase the budget, okay. or change the budget. Yeah. That was my only confusion at all, and I didn't know if we should say like the, the, the total amount of the adopted budget or something like that, but if nobody else has any issues, we can just approve it this way. I don't. You're fine? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. We're fine. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 4 0. Next one is a policy DJE for purchasing and, make, and, and purchasing uh, for the school within the district. Um, so this motion is to approve the first reading for policy DJE uh, entitled purchasing. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Comments. <coughs> so, what is the source of this change? Is it is it just is it <coughs> practice or is it uh, updating to meet law or? Looks like it's clarifying that. So, so all of these, just to clarify, these are all MASC re related changes that the policy subcommittee weeded out, selected some, selected others. Okay. Michael had a large amount of input here. There were some that we decided we actually liked, we had better. Um, but in any cases where he felt that the language either fit better with updates to the regulations, you'll see some specific dollar amounts that have changed, or others that we felt just uh, better described our process um, than what was currently there, um, we went with. This is one that we just thought it was a little bit cleaner language, yep. so we, we, we struck out some and, and uh, did the new one. Okay. My, and my, my, my only comment on this one is, <clears throat> obviously a lot of these things I think are gonna be overseen by Michael, not by you, and, it, it, and I just wonder if it should say, it shall be the responsibility of the superintendent or designee. to over or, or designate or to say to oversee the procurement of materials. I, I just think there should be something there like that points out that you don't have to actually. Well, if you go down to the it. second to last paragraph, it actually says superintendent will <coughs> yeah. designate the purchasing the agent. Correct. But I just want to be very clear on like, like he doesn't have to like. I, you could, I could, I kind of looked at like, well, does he have to actually sign the final thing because it's his responsibility well, or? It references that. He will assign a purchasing agent. Right. So I think that's <laughs> referencing that he's to, ad to administer the appointing the, the duties to the appropriate per procurement official, purchasing agent, whatever you want. I'm comfortable. With that. I had a similar when we first went through it. Yeah. I actually had a similar comment, and then <coughs> looked more at the last couple of paragraphs. Well, I saw the last couple of paragraphs. I just didn't know if that in, in any way, because it's later on. I just worry that like it. I don't know if putting in the last paragraph, like, is that separate from the other responsibilities? So I would think it would be cleaner to just say <coughs> it's a responsibility to oversee the, at the very beginning, instead of to procure, to oversee the procurement of materials, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> or put up I, front I or mean, the desi designee of. So. You could certainly add oversee easy enough. <coughs> but. but then you've got to change the language of each bullet. Or, or we can say <laughs> the responsibility of the superintendent in overseeing the purchasing agent. Yeah. I'm comfortable with the language the way it is. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, respectfully, I would say I do oversee that through Michael. Yep. But I'm I'm responsible for those points. Yep. And again, the buck stops. <coughs> the buck will stop. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I always just yeah. I always just question again. I'm not. I don't care too much either way. I, I just always question like if a situation came up where like there was a argument about who did this, like if 
Michael Connolly purchased something and did it have to have Dr. Daly's express approval or not? And I don't know. Again, if, if people are comfortable with it, that's fine. I don't, I'm not gonna give, give die in this one here, but I, I, I think it should specifically say it could be designated, but. Uh, so. I'm fine with the last two paragraphs and it's explicitly calling out the designations or designees. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. <laughs> Passes 3 1. Fair enough. <coughs> um, procurement requirements. Procurement requirements DJED. Uh, so this is a motion to uh, approve the first reading of uh, policy DJED pre uh, procurement requirements. Second. Motion a second. Comments? And the comment was at school committee, not committee. <laughs> Other than that, I'm good. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 4 0. <laughs> So the next one is uh, GBE BD, um, and that's uh, online fundraising and solicita solicitations slash crowdfunding. Uh, this is one we went through a bit, um, but when you go through it, it sort of it it really does address the need. <coughs> yeah. Um, so. This is a motion to approve the first reading of policy GBE BD online fundraising and solic solicitations slash or dash crowdfunding. Second. That's a lot of words. Yeah. Cindy, of I'm, I'm, Cindy, I'm sorry if you're listening. Um, <laughs> I have one substantive, with a motion a second, I have one substantive comment in the very last paragraph. All goods and proceeds solicited and received and proceeds solicited and received through any online solic solicitation shall become the property of the school committee. <coughs> is it the school committee's property or is it the district's property? I would think it's a district. I mean, <coughs> hmm. and not the individual that employee. A, yeah, I think yeah. it, that is odd. Oh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. I think they're either looking at the school committee ultimately has con in its responsibility, it's but, but it's much clearer yeah. just to say the school district. The district. I would change that. Yeah. I, would. I would think that should be district. Good catch. <coughs> I mean, otherwise we have a pot of funds that we can just fix some of these problems with. At least. Well, school, as your school district is in the protocol handbook that we give to teachers on this. By the way, yeah. good, good yeah. job, Mr. Buckley. That was our slush fund. Oh, I know, I know. There we go. Yeah. Work on that. <laughs> our parties can no longer be funded by this. No so. more pizza. <laughs> So this just no impacts in Naples. <laughs> this policy just impacts the uh, the work of, of employees of the district. Correct. Right? Correct. Uh, people who are doing their crowdfunding <coughs> outside of the separate. Yep. Okay. That was the first thing. My first three words I like, yeah. highlighted them. Okay. So all those in favor as revised. Aye. 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 Opposed. Passes four zero. Next one deals with uh, universal free lunches. Uh, so this is policy EFC. This is very much an eye test for me, so sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, universal free, uh, free school meals. So uh, motion to, appr uh, to approve first reading of policy EFC, universal free school meals. We have a second. We have a motion and we have a second. Any changes? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just capitalize district. <laughs> Other than that, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 4-0. So this is uh, this is policy. The next policy is EFD School Nutrition Program uh, Change Policy. So uh, this motion is to approve the first reading of policy EFD School Nutrition Program Change Policy. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Any changes here? I don't think there was anything here other than a cut one school district, but. <laughs> Other than that, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes four to zero. And I think that was it, right? That should be <coughs> do we have to do, did, did you specifically say replacing EEC? Uh, I did not, but that's in there. That's the other, the yeah. existing charge policy. So do we have to have a, do we have to have a separate motion to re rescind that policy? <coughs> it's a one-to-one -one replacement. 
Um, but I, I think I think the motion either has to should say it needs to replace it or we have to rescind I can it. Revise so. the motion. Why, why, don't we, why don't we do the motion again just okay. to? Um, yeah. So motion to approve the first reading of uh, policy EFD, which explicitly replaces EEC, um, and the policy, uh, the replacing policy is school nutrition program change policy. Second. Okay, with a motion and a second, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 4 0. Thank you. Just to, just to clarify, it's the charge policy. Yeah. No charge. No. Why did I say change? Oh, yes, wow. the charge policy. Okay. That's terrible. <laughs> okay. One would think you know how to read if you're on the school today. There we go. Routine matters. Shiny. We have minutes. Diana's not here. Anybody want to read the or approve the open session? I will move that the committee vote to approve the open session minutes from the March 25th, 2024 meeting as written. Okay. We have a motion. We have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, passes 4 0. And I move that the committee vote to approve the <laughs> executive session minutes from the March 25th, 2024 session. Second. My only comment on this is we don't have, I don't have access to this. I don't know if anybody else did, just to check them. <laughs> Which one? The executive session. Executive. <coughs> I'd like to at least be able to open it before. Is that right? <laughs> but we can, we can table that. I'm sorry. Yep. Let's just do that one later on, just because I want to yep. be able to at least look at it. Um, okay, budget update. Do we do enough budget updates today? Yeah, there is. Okay. A, I table that to the next meeting. <laughs> That's good. Um, staffing. It's a brief staffing update. Yep. <coughs> One position. Sorry, two. Uh, Renessa Doucette, long term substitute, grade three at Bachelor School, and Jordan Haynes, long term substitute, speech and language pathologist. Um, <coughs> services for Welcome. My only comment on this one is. I alluded to this earlier, and Dr. Daly probably, if he knows me, knows I'm going to bring this up. We haven't been able to hire an athletic trainer. <clears throat> I do think we should – I'd be interested in seeing what the salary is that's being offered just to make sure that we hopefully can get that for next year, if not the spring sure, season. Yeah, so. I, I was going to address that earlier. But I'll just say very briefly, we um, absolutely consider it a, a funding priority. Um, <laughs> we've had for many years a training position through a, a subcontract. They were not able to fulfill their obligation due to shortfalls. We not only kept that position posted, but we also did two other things this year. We posted a position separately at a competitive salary, and we're not able to find anyone. And then we also patch filled it, worked with other communities. Um, all of the required um, events were, did have a trainer at right. this year. But but we are absolutely looking at that posting um, to make sure it continues to be competitive so we can have someone in-house. Yeah. Is that unusual for that not to be filled? It's starting to, it's unusual for us. It's not, it's, it is now sort of uh, a trend in the, in the field. I think part of this, I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but one reason is similar to counseling. There's yeah. so much to be made privately. Yeah. Um, that it's not as attractive. What's the what's yeah. the requirement? Like, is it is it like a physical therapy? Physical therapy. Okay. All right. This they also changed the licensing requirement, made it more difficult. So yeah. the pool of qualified candidates suddenly sh shrunk. And Supply what demand. what percent? Like what? Yeah. Like uh, how much time does it? Like it's about 20 to 25 hours per okay. week. Okay. So you someone got you got your physical therapy license? Yeah. No, I'm just curious yeah. because. Yeah. Someone asked me about it, and so I'm curious. Yeah. It's um, challenging hours, too, because of nights, yeah, weekends. It's nice. Yeah, it's nice. You know. It's too bad that you can't, like, work it in with, like, and obviously you have to have the accreditation, but, like, a master's program or something, you know, and with all the, all the training or schools around here, that would be. The arrangement with the, with the company was worked really well. Was that was, they, yeah, we were <coughs> making out for a while. We had a, that was a good. Harmaline, yeah. Yeah, yeah. relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay, hey, bids and donations, Mr. McGowan. Yeah, so I move that the committee vote to accept with gratitude the donation of $18,000 from North Reading Diamond Club to be used towards the concrete pad for the new stands and seating at the high school, at the high school baseball field. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Uh, my only comment, Mr. Connolly, do you have any idea? The Diamond Club has given a lot of money in the last couple of yes. years. Can you summarize for us like how much it is and maybe next meeting or something just kind of 
look over the last year or two. Like, I'm just curious, and, and I wonder if we should, you know, invite them and recognize them yeah. because they've given a lot of money. Yeah, it's a great question. They have. Um, we actually recognized them back in okay. 2020. Um, oh, I was here. Sorry. And they, <laughs> but that, at the time, we recognized them over the previous three or four years, and it was up to almost thirty thousand dollars. Yeah. So now it's been almost the same time frame. Okay. About three, three, three and a half years, and I think it's either, it's very much close to that, if not maybe a little exceeded that. Yeah. I thought they even did more about, with the, with the dugouts and did they do anything on the school scoreboard? They weren't the scoreboard, but they were they were the dugouts. They did some work with the, um, the scoreboard sod huh? replacement. Mm -hmm. um, there's been some other little in kind donations they did batting cage um, repairs and upgrades uh, to the indoor batting cage, outdoor batting cage. This is the other big initiative that we're working with. So um, it's certainly been a good partnership. Yeah. So is is this a new this is a new development, right? Or at least I don't know. If we, I don't remember this being discussed at academic at the athletic subcommittee. Is this something that's because we've talked about this project in general at, at athletic subcommittee? This is a piece of that. Yeah. This yeah. Is the, the pad that would go on their bleachers. Yep. Now that um, would be moved to accommodate all the other work we did with the net, with the netting and everything. Yep. Okay. So we have a motion. We have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I'm assuming you said aye. I did uh, say four aye. Four zero. Passes is four zero. Um, no grants at this time. Not at this time. No overnight trip requests at this time. Not at this time. <coughs> Subcommittee updates. Finance planning team has have met every week. Mr. McGowan missed the last two. Everybody heard what we've talked about, so I'm not going to go into anything more unless you have anything to add to that, Dr. Daly or Mr. Connolly. No. Okay. We have uh, notes. We have uh, minutes for the executive session <coughs> available. Okay. You want to do a motion on that then? I will move that the committee vote to approve the minutes from the executive session from March 25th, 2024, as written. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. <coughs> I am looking at it. Looks good to me. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 4 0. Thank you very much. <coughs> um, Capital Planning Improvement Committee. I always say that wrong. Capital Planning Improvement Committee. CPIC. I know. Um, it is. Yeah, we, so we met. Uh, we're sort of being weekly at this point. Uh, there are a number of large projects. It's the same thing that we talked about earlier. A uh, number of large projects that, that really need to get done. It impacts everything across the town, including schools. And uh, just figuring out where the red line's going to be. <coughs> um, you know, obviously this will impact uh, top of an override, too. Well, and it'll be without giving too much away, it'll be part of the, it'll be maybe a part of the inclusion of that potentially too, so. That's what we're trying to do so that there's not multiple competing projects going on at the same time, so. Um, policy subcommittee. We just covered it. We just covered we've it. Seen the, we've yeah. seen the fruit there of their go. labor. There we go, subcommittee schedule, finance planning team is meeting again on Friday. Oh no, wait, it's, it's Thursday, Thursday this week. Thursday, yeah. We moved it to Thursday. You, you, if you can't make it, I can make it. So, I couldn't. A lot of people couldn't make it on Friday. Before. I'll probably be there. So Wednesday all night, and then <laughs> Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> Monday, Wednesday, Thursday. Yes. And I've been on th meeting Thursday night. We've been doing a lot. Well, CPIC is <coughs> Thursday morning too. Oh yeah. Um, CIPC meets Thursday morning. Yeah. Wait at the same time. What time are you? It's right. It's right after. Wait. What time are we meeting then? We're at eight fifteen. We're at eight fifteen. CIPC is right after. You're later then. Really? I thought we were 8.15 too. I don't know, that's what Michael had said to me. <coughs> so. well, I actually got up and left, so what, what? I thought we were 8.15, uh, I'll, I'll pass it on. <laughs> but that's gonna, yeah, it's conflicting though, right? We it's trump like, you. I didn't know if they, <laughs> I, I thought, because Dawn there. goes, Dawn, they all go. Everyone, everyone's in that meeting, so. Yeah, you wouldn't yeah. have a form. <laughs> I thought there was talk about moving it, but I, then I missed the end. <laughs> You could stand outside the uh, the room. Yeah. Or maybe you could all just sit in on the, on the, on the yeah, I'm not team there. meeting. No, Jeff can't. <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't have. That'd be three. Sure. <laughs> it can't be three. Yeah. Okay, athletic subcommittee scheduled to meet May 21st at noon. Fine arts subcommittee after that at 3:15. Administrative report. Not at this time. Correspondence. Not at this time. Future business. We have a meeting on April 10th. That is Wednesday. The joint meeting with the select board, finance committee, and CIPC. <clears throat> 
Um, and on Monday, April 22nd, we'll say this every time, Jeff, at the Hood School, we have a meeting. One mistake. Or Jeff. <coughs> One mistake. Are we going to do a budget workshop? So, so two things. One, the meeting on Wednesday is here in this room. Yes. Um, and <coughs> that's a question I have for you. Do, you, do, you, do we want to do a budget workshop? Do we actually want to have the budget vote that night, or is that something we would continue to discuss <coughs> after the 10th? We need more time, you know, as a session. We have to have a budget meeting by a certain date. So generally it's around May first. Yeah. We've gone we've gone later than that. So I think how do we table it until we find out what's gonna happen? But what are we what are we voting? Are we just voting the the balanced budget one? I think vote. we're I think you're voting both. I think we're, we're voting we're gonna have to vote both. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're voting the allocation of if we had to have a balanced budget, so you either we made a recommendation this evening, so we'd want to workshop that and then either decide <coughs> consensus on that, and then we're voting what would be the the. Um, I would say that the overall even if yeah. we have to do two separate votes, the the the, on there. the budget, you know, the 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 budget as the, with the revenue plan as it currently exists, there's no getting around that. So that I feel like we should. <coughs> vote on the 22nd if we need to have a quick workshop to talk over <coughs> the uh, the cuts bef before then th that af you know that afternoon I guess we should but it's interesting because my I'm, I'm on the opposite end where I feel like the far right column revised modified I'm 100% in favor of I think that's cut and dry it's everything we have right now getting rid of full day kindergarten in 1.6 positions yeah. I think that we can vote right now my question is on the other one. If we should try to, you know, use some of the revolving account for paraprofessionals, should we, can we put a little more food service in there? Like, that's the part that I wonder if we could workshop a little bit. Um, right, well, that's so the number we saying the same. Leave it what, there. Which is, right? That's what I'm, I said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. have a workshop. Correct, yeah. correct. Yeah. But I mean, and would we be ready to vote it that evening? Yeah, maybe not. If we workshop before, I think we would be. I, right? I don't know. Would you want to do it yeah. immediately before, or would you want to workshop? So we can we can we can follow off of the April tenth meeting to see you know, see where, where yeah, we stand. If yeah. there's no appetite that's for any kind of discussion after April tenth, then we might have a different cuts cuts to the that's, chase a little bit. That's what I would say. So I need a so we have. At that point. But I do think the only reason I don't really want to push it beyond April twenty second is we have to be talking about the override to the community. And we have to know what those cuts are. Oh, I think we'll know by then. I, I'm just yeah. saying. Correct. After after <coughs> Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. So I I think I think we should try to keep it. I guess I would keep both for April twenty second right now at least, because I do think we could see. Can we save a couple of positions or do something so like I, that? I guess the only real question is, do you want to work? Do you want to move a workshop a little earlier than the twenty second, so that we ha so so we can have a kind of a little back and a little that, back and that's forth. helpful for you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I would agree. Yeah. So if we could make that happen, <coughs> but. So let's try to find a date, and it can just be, it could just be a remote one if we need to as well. Yeah. yeah. We could just do a remote one. And just um, an hour. It has so. to be a public meeting, though, so it'll be a remote one, um, not executive session, but we could post it. Let, let, why don't we, on the 10th, why don't we talk about when that might work, if you guys want to propose a yeah, that's couple of days, fine. or we could even do it like a lunchtime, like a 12 to 1 or something, if people, that, if that works for it's people. Be, yeah, I gotta look at <laughs> okay. Let, let, let's see. So, 7 a.m. I said something out. I'd be fine with that. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Let, let's look at something like I mean, uh, like, yeah. And then trying to do because I, I would like to be able to vote the budget on April 22nd, so yeah, we know no, what the numbers are. So. That, that and that meeting, meeting is at the hood. So. And also the Should be fun. <clears throat> oh, we're not done, are we? Okay. I need a motion to go into executive session. <laughs> I, I move that. Uh, hang on, where, I'm, where, where am I here? Right here? I move that the committee vote to enter executive session and to not return to open session, in order to discuss collective bargaining strategy with the North Reading Education Association, as having the discussion in open session would have a detrimental effect on the public body's negotiating position and bargaining position. That would be us. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. We have to do a roll call vote. Rich. Aye. Noel. Aye. Jeff. I'm in I as well. Passes 4-0. Thank you, everybody who attended tonight. Yep, thank you, guys. Thank you don't you. have to go home, but you can't stay here. <laughs> <laughs>